right on welcome everybody come one come all welcome heathens and apostates to another exciting episode of conspiracy or not here we come for your listening displeasure and look who we have today i'm very excited to be speaking with ken humphreys from england and it's late for you ken thank you so much for your time hello Hello. Yes, it's late, but I'll stay with you. <laughs> uh, I do appreciate it. I'm a big, big fan. I'm a big fan. Hi, Amy. How have you been? Oh, I've been hanging in here. How about yourself? I'm good. I'm good. Let's do this. I've got six and a half pages worth of notes. Let's not waste any time. Our dear friend Gandalf <laughs> is not with us. He's often very late, but he'll probably pop in any time. So we're just going to roll with the punches here. So, uh, Ken, again, I just have to thank you so much for your time. I seriously, seriously appreciate it. Uh, do us a favor for those who are not familiar with you. Um, just go ahead and give us a, a, your bio. Tell us who you are, what you're about, and how you got started doing what you're doing. Oh, my gosh. Um, okay. Um, I write about Jesus. I record uh, YouTubes nowadays about Jesus haven't always done that of course i i uh, i've had a varied career most of it either in the computer industry or as an academic so i've taught in colleges both in britain and abroad but as a sort of uh, you could say a, 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 a retirement occupation i got into jesus um i was born an atheist i should say that i was born an atheist and i've always stayed an atheist so the idea of religion always struck me as slightly lunic, you know, lunacy, um, but people did. I was aware that people did, but I always thought, well, that's for them. They're silly. But I never took it too seriously. But now I've gone on to the fact that, um, you know, let, let's study it. And so I have. I've studied it from a point of view of dis a, a historian looking for evidence of, of, of uh you know, Christ and uh, his church and early discovery. It didn't take long, really, to discover that really there was very little evidence. In fact, one would always argue no evidence uh, of Jesus or his church in the way in which one is led to believe. And so I thought this is something worth documenting. That's the whole point. Let's look at what the Bible and its gospel and the gospels claim and I've written, you know, what, what seems to be a rational response to that. And it's led me, first of all, to write a book. Um, I don't know if you can see this. The book, yep. Jesus Never Existed. Um, in a response to a request for a smaller book, this one, uh, an introduction. And uh, subsequently, I've... Uh, moved on to youtube and you'll find perhaps a hundred youtube video productions which illustrate different aspects of the biblical and gospel claims and what uh, i'd say reality has to prove uh, uh, about those claims so that's what I, I i do um many a time i've spoken to uh, radio audiences in in the state so i'm pleased to um, join you Rufus uh, for this this particular show and uh, let, let's see where it takes us to um... well fabulous um, this is literally one of my favorite subject subjects to talk about I believe you have made the same statement yourself that it's just one of your favorite things to talk about I find it endlessly fascinating how and particularly I, what I enjoy most about your presentations um, is the way that you approach from a logistical standpoint. I've mentioned to my audience um, that I'm a contractor, and as a contractor, my brain is geared into lo the logistics of, of every aspect of what I do. Before I start any job, I will typically do the entire job in my head before I even pick up a single tool. And I'm always thinking about how to get this done, and every time I approach a problem, um, I'm always thinking about what's the best way to make this happen or that happen. And um, so um, I, I really do appreciate the way that you approach these things. Well, that, that's good. I mean, 
People have often commented on the style, and it does seem to suit a lot of people. Um, a few Christians have, have, have complained that perhaps I'm a bit aggressive, that I'm a bit, you know, shoot, shoot them straight in the eye. Um, but I, I'm not in the in. in no, I'm not interested in, in pussyfooting around sensitive Christians who don't like anybody challenging their faith. If, if, if it's anything worth defending, they can, they can listen to the most extreme arguments and, and, and rebut them if they could. But they can't, of course. Um, so, it, 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 yeah, it, it's, a, it's a challenging area. Um, it, and it, and it, it's endlessly fascinating. I, I don't know how you'd interpret the current scene in the states but in britain today it's it's hardly anybody has a a, a, a traditional view of christianity it's a very much a, a pick and mix interpretation of what bits they believe and what they don't often they will dismiss some of the stories they just can't even christians can't handle some of the stories so it, it's very difficult to have a rigorous debate with with uh, christians in this country that's why it's, it's fun to 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 come across to the states, and uh, you have a few, few fundamentalists over there, I believe. Uh, we've got, argue. we've got a few, <laughs> and and their whole families to go. Sure, <laughs> yeah. In fact, it's it's only a slight exaggeration to say there's a church on every corner. Very, <laughs> just a very slight. <laughs> it's only a slight exaggeration. Mm. It's it's almost literally true that there's a church on every corner. So um. Yeah, and and that 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 sort of it's challenge. You know, Europeans. I, I if I can be so bold to say, Europeans find America's fascination with Christ uh, and and Christianity a bit over the top. You know, it's, it's we're, we're Europe is but largely post-Christian. You know, it's a quaint historical uh, phenomenon that, that you know. Whereas America still seems to be living and breathing it. Which is which is odd for a prosperous country. It's extremely odd. In fact, it, it's almost as if uh, it's almost as if we've taken a step backwards. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the NIFB, the New International Fundamentalist Baptist Church. There is a pastor in particular called Stephen Anderson who is openly calling for the death of gay people. It's, <laughs> I, I'm not even joking. There. They're almost as bad as the Westboro Baptist Church, and I'm sure you're familiar with those characters, the guys with the... I've heard of that one, yes. Uh -huh, the rainbow-colored mm. signs that says, God hates fags, and these are the people who go and protest funerals for soldiers, uh, just the worst dregs of any any society or any religious group uh, whatsoever. Yeah, uh, we're, we're pretty embarrassed in America when it comes to our religious fundamentalism. At least some of us are. Mm. Yes, th those of us who look at it and go, "Oh my goodness!" <laughs> so you've always been an yeah. atheist. So you're not one of those people who was raised in a religious family who had to, you know, wake yourself up and shake off, right? Uh, so you've always been an atheist, yes? No, ab absolutely not. Uh, it, 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 you know, uh, and I, it, the point is worth making because a lot of the writers who, who write about Jesus from a, a mythicist point of view are ex-Christians, ex-fundamentalist Christians. You know, they were raised, they, some of them were, were even ministers in some church or other. And yet they reached a point where they could no longer believe the fables. They began to realize that the, the whole thing was a, was a fabrication. And then they cross, crossed the tracks and, and started to argue against it. Now, it gives them one particular advantage that from knee high, they learned all the stories about Jesus and, and, and what he supposedly said and, and, and did. Whereas, my family didn't take any of that uh, seriously, and I grew up in an atheistic culture, um, and it was just something, you know, strange. Where, you know, the the odd religious person was a little bit of a a, a, a freak, uh, and and so I've had to learn a lot of that fundamentalist stuff from from the word go. But it does mean that I didn't get uh, in, in, indoctrinated in a way that many people struggle to escape right. and i hear that that 
you know, from from people who write to me, they say I have been a, 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 a you know a Baptist preacher for twenty years, but I realised in the last four years it's all rubbish. You know, and they've finally escaped after a lifetime of living that nonsense. Yes, I I count myself as very lucky too because my parents made the conscious choice to raise their children without religion. And the only time religion ever came up in my family was these people believe this and those people believe that. <laughs> and that's as far as it went in my family. Lots of love. Well, ex excellent. You know, when it comes it was... to when it, when it comes to preachers and ministers who like you said you you get that letter um that has to be the hardest. I mean, it's one thing for an individual person to just come to the realization that they either don't believe anymore or that it's all rubbish. But it's something else entirely when your livelihood and your mortgage, your friends and your family completely depend on the fact that you're you're a minister. And then, you know, I mean, to leave, I mean, that's your job, literally. What else are you going to do? You spent your whole life. You don't have a trade. You don't have a craft. How else do you even earn an income? I mean, those people really have it hard. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with um, uh, Dan Barker's. Um, it's uh, yes. Oh crap! It just left my my mind. What's what's it called? It's um, uh, he's got a a website that's uh, right now. I think it's got 1,300 members. It's it's for specifically for preachers, pastors, and ministers who who have lost their faith and are looking for some support group to get out of what they did what they do there. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll think of it in a moment. It's a stand. Sure, it's it's a little bit of a joke. Uh, that, uh, uh, certainly among humanists in, in Britain, that you know, but most clergymen for the Church of England are, are non-believers. They're either atheists or they certainly lost faith in, in the whole Christian bit. Oh, but actually, actually it's ca actually it's called the clergy. It's called the clergy <laughs> project. It's called the clergy project. Yeah. So that Dan. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So they have to live a lie, but at least it's what a, a one day a week job or whatever it is they do. Right, right. So um, let's um, let's jump right into this. Um, first question I have for you is something that has just sort of st stuck in my craw for many, many, many years. This concept, this idea that this Satan character would do God's bidding and punish the unbelievers and punish the apostates and the blasphemers and whatnot. I found it really bizarre, just almost my entire life. This Satan character who, the antithesis of God, he is the poser of everything that it stands that God stands for. Why would he bother punishing people? Isn't he the first one to reject God? Why would Satan basically punish people for doing what he did for rejecting this idea of God. Do you know what I mean? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's just a bizarre notion that Satan would... <laughs> yeah, but then is, is it Satan who punishes people or is it God who does that? I thought that God, you know, is, is that famous quote is it from Isaiah? I, I'm God. I, I, I do good things and bad things. You know, yeah, I am a, God. I, I create the, the light and the dark. I create good and I, ev I create evil. I am the Lord God. I do all these things. Yeah, that that's right. So, is it so? Where does Satan come in? You know, we have to deal with this. Is this, a, you know, I, I I can't take seriously the notion of Satan at all. I mean, you know, one might argue about God existing, not existing as a cause of the universe, but where on earth does Satan fit into that? You know, does he does he willingly allow a a a, a, a sort of a force for evil to coexist with himself? Is that what he sets up? You know, a form of dualism. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm just lost with that whole concept because it strikes me as utter, utter nonsense. So you have, um, you've debated theology at Oxford. Is that correct? Wasn't that uh, the Oxford? Um, where was that? I've, I saw oh, I've, you debate. I've, 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 I've debated many places. I'm not sure theology per se. I, don't, I, um, I, I, I discussed. Uh, Many related subjects. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're thinking of when you say that comment. Um, 
uh, uh, you know, I don't always discuss Jesus. I mean, I'm often called into discussions on the nature of God. Does God exist? You know, yeah, and the and you you can run through the various arguments, and and it's been done so effectively in recent years with Richard Richard Dawkins and and uh, Chris, uh, uh, was it um, yeah, Chris, Chris? The name forgets me at the moment. Um, Christopher, somebody. Um, Hitchens. You know, we've we've had the the, the God is not great. Hitchens. Um, it, Hitchens. That's it. Christopher Hitchens. You know. They have very effectively dealt with the the, the, the problems of, of a, supposing a God exists. And, and one of the other interests I have, quite apart from Jesus, is, is cosmology. And the more that we understand about the scale and, 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 and complexity of the universe, a God coming into it is vanishingly in, irrelevant. You know, it's, it's so, so, so pathetic to think that there's a god behind it all and it's, it's such a a marvelous creation you know and it, it, it's well there we go i find mm. it i find you know one of the biggest pro problems i've had with any of the stories that we learn about from the bible is this starting with the notion that god is omniscient so he knows everything he knows the past and the present and the future and he knows every hair on your head etc he knows what you're thinking knows what you're going to do and then when you apply this concept of omniscience to any of the stories relating to the bible where god is directly involved particularly genesis the garden it's just absurd on its face is it not how about well yeah go ahead yeah. i mean it, it as if as if god didn't know i mean the, the the way it's written it's almost as if god didn't know how how it was going to turn out <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, every every dimension for God just sort of lands up in in in, in, in being self contradictory. Um, where where do we get we, we begin with that notion? You know, the the church itself um, uh, has, has almost persistent. The church itself has left behind these stories, which for centuries were taken literally. Yeah, but, you know, there was a literal belief in, in all those stories of Adam and Eve and, and Noah's Ark and, and uh, uh, you know, you know those, those stories. Um, but, of course, once modern science appeared and, and, and began to contradict the church in such fundamental ways, of course, the church had to begin to migrate its understandings of holy, the Holy Scripture from a literal truth to allegory. And so it certainly, these stories had to be interpreted. You know, they weren't meant to be literally true, but allegorical truths. And, and so that, that's when the, whole, the, the old edifice of, of Holy Mother Church began to collapse, really, and, and the emergence of, of the modern world. And the more that science advances, the more that I think it still remains true. You know, religion is is backed into a, a smaller and smaller area. Okay, I wanted to do this from the very beginning, but I also I wanted to wait at least for a few minutes to get let some of our viewers filter in, and I'm pretty sure that we're up and running with most people are are watching live. Um, I want to read to you just like two sentences from Sam Harris, one of his presentations on religion and death that I thought were pretty profound and worthy of note, and you're free to comment on these. Um, <clears throat> first, um, first, he says that death is actually a denial for religion. And I've heard many people mention that religion is, is, is a death cult. Christianity is a cult of death as they focus on uh, the, the, the death and resurrection of Christ, and then all the various sacrifices, human sacrifices throughout the, the tales of the Bible. But Sam Harris says death is actually a denial for religion, even reincarnation. He says it's also a platitude because ultimately things will be sorted out, as it were. And, and that's a mantra that many Christians have in the back of their minds is that, oh, you know, and I've heard this from, from the faithful speaking to atheists, they'll say, well, you'll find out in the end, 
you know, you'll find out when you die, when you stand before God, blah, blah, blah. So here's the, here's the two sentences. Number one, he says, to not believe in God is to know that it falls on us to make the world a better place. Now, I think that's a fairly profound statement and it's worthy of note. And whether whether you're faithful or not, I think that is that statement right there alone should be something that ought to be uh, memorialized. The other thing he said, I think, and you might get a chuckle out of this one. He says, no more than a hundred generations back, no matter how educated or cultured your family, you will meet someone who thinks sacrificing your firstborn child just might be a good way to control the weather. <laughs> yeah, chuckle indeed, yeah. <laughs> Except it's so horrible, isn't it? I mean, that's the thing, you all religions and Christianity, with no exception, it is uh, they masquerade as su uh, such a loving kind, it's loving kindness personified. But the, you know, death cult is is a good way of putting it. I mean, we've had a a, mu a much more graphic modern religious movement in recent times with ISIS and its suicide bombings and torturings and and beheadings, you know, but. As I've remarked before, nothing that ISIS did was not pioneered by the Christian Church in its day, when it had the power and and and, and the and the and the the will to destroy people to preserve its 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 ideas of what was true and what was false, and uh, yeah, de de Defco is is indeed that thing, and I I think it's it's very sad really that I think some of the true motives for devotion are very selfish um, understandings. You know, the, the number of people who fear that, you know, it, it, by their attendance of, of, uh, of church, or, uh, that they will thereby be chosen to be living in this life eternal in heaven you know it, it's it's sort of a a very what about me what am i getting out of it sort of notion isn't it so not only is it a death cult it's, it it cultivates some of the worst uh, motives in human behavior don't do something because it is morally correct do it because god is watching you and you'll have hell to pay if you don't do what god says and so yeah, I, although I wouldn't say everything about Christianity is awful, it does inspire some people to be charitable works, but essentially it, 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 it is a very dubious and, and, and frightening uh, form of human behavior. It certainly has its insidious uh, aspects to it. I, I, yes, it does. I, I forget... <laughs> I forget the author of this quote, um, but I heard it very recently. Somebody said, um, science flies people to the moon. Religion flies people into buildings. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Well, there you go. It, 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 it's, it's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. And yet you have those... Um, sort of a statements that often come from Christians that things like would, would the apostles have died for a lie you know there's a funny, you know one that comes around all the time would they have died for a lie and we know that people do horrible things including self-sacrifice for the most ob obnoxious of motives and and, and 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 falsehoods so yeah um well, I'm glad you brought that up. I actually had a note to, to bring that up because it is a common apologetic. Why would they die for a lie? Well, people yeah, die for oh. people die for lies all the time. And even if they believe it themselves, it still doesn't make it true. Exactly. So, yeah, I can no, make, it, I can think of <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 after you. Well, I was just going to say, I can think of several things where people have died for lies <laughs> and it agreed. It doesn't make it true just because they decided that it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've heard, oh, as you can imagine, I've had my website 
for many years and and i've had many many uh responses from christians and and the, the, the defenses are so predictable um that it, it almost you could almost sing them um I mean, this is the, the die for a lie one, and and the, I, there's always that one. Uh, yeah, but what have you got to lose? You know, if I'm if I'm right, you know, uh, I'll wake up with God. Uh, but if I'm wrong, well, I, I've done the right thing. But but you 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 haven't got anything to look forward to. You know, there's another apologetic. You, you, oh, that's Pascal's you get the one, wager. Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's. So it's so blatantly false. I mean, so why don't you believe it in the Norse gods, for example? Why, you, why is it the Christian gods the right one then? You know, that doesn't prove anything. But as often has been said, people who don't come, who come to Christian faith, but not from logic, um, you'll never defeat them by logical arguments because it's 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 not where, where they're at. That's right. I mean, and I I have given lectures, you know, for an hour or two, and 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 people have simply smiled at me at the end. These are Christians, smiled at me at the end and said, "Ah, yes, but I know Jesus loves me, and I know Jesus helped me, and I talked to him, and and you know, and and you you there's there's no logical." Uh, way out of, of of you know for them to be led out by by logic because they just don't want to believe in logic you know they, they they find there's a higher truth a higher truth than than than, than, than rationality um that you know on the on the on the concept of pascal's wager i would say just simply considering that this con this idea that god is omniscient pascal's wager falls on its face with that thought alone, um, you can't you can't convince yourself. You can't make yourself believe something. You have to be convinced of it. So, if God knows your mind, then He knows that you're not your heart's not in it. That you don't really believe it. So, I don't see how Pascal's wager would fly by someone like God, who is omniscient and can read your mind. No, no, no. It's no, absurd. It, it, yeah, but it still has currency, you know. It, it you we, we still have to rebut those sort of arguments endlessly, endlessly. It's true. Um. Yeah. It. It. It's. It is endless. There's. You know. But on the other hand, I have to realize that there's there's new people, uh, listening. New people you know, thinking about these things all the time and they haven't heard all of the counter apologetics. And so, Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's, yeah, it's I, take, you know, I take your point. Absolutely. So it's still, you know, the battle, it's still going to be a battle and it's, it's still going to be a worthy conversation and this, it's still worth having. <laughs> so let's get to our topics. I want to talk about Paul. Are you ready to talk about Paul? Because I I'm have... always ready to talk about Paul. I have a friend, um, an, an older gentleman, who espouses Paul all the time when him and I speak, and we're always talking about these things. And he, like many, many Christians, they, he, they, they, they hold up Paul as the, the pillar of the whole narrative. So... Um, in one of your presentations on YouTube, you mentioned in uh, in Acts that uh, as they uh, as they describe Paul, the author of Acts describes Paul, the final chapter pretty much fizzles out. I mean, what's going on there? Well, how do, how is it that this character Paul? I mean, we don't really we don't know how he died, right? We don't know when, where mm -hmm. he died, how he died. We don't mm -hmm. know any of the circumstances. All we know is the last. A uh, little bit of a tale of his life, where he was supposedly renting a house for a couple of years. We don't know how he paid for it. He had a Roman guard or two uh, keeping an eye on him. Supposedly under house arrest, he was receiving guests. He was receiving um, uh, Jewish uh, pre high priests as as house guests. So it was no small abode. So what? What? Talk to me about Paul. What's going on there? Well, Paul. Yeah, I love Paul. Paul, 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 Paul is, is in many senses, dominates the New Testament at least as much, if not more than Jesus. As, 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 he's much more substantial. Um, his life 
in one sense echoes that of his master of Jesus, but in another sense is 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 like a a, a, a miasma. It, it's it, you you can't actually find Paul in reality in history. That's an extraordinary thing. When you when you look at Jesus, you get ah the so-called witnesses, non-Christian witnesses of Jesus, the, the odd paragraph that's in, 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 in Josephus, you know, the reference by Suetonius, the reference by Tacitus and so on. You get those passing references which any mythicist has to rebut again and again and again, right? But with Paul, there are no secular references to him at all. Now, why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because he supposedly dominated the world in which he lived in the sense he would come into a town, let's say Ephesus, one of the major cities of the Roman world, and turn it, turn it into, a, you know, overturn it, the peaceful city, in, into a, a, you know, a tumult. There, there would be the riot in the theatre, the calls by Paul, you know, and, and yet all these events are never recorded in, in secular history at all, right? So all we have to go by is what the Bible presents on Paul, right? Now, OK, so it presents a lot, a lot, you know, at least a third, a third of the New Testament is taken up with, with Paul in some fashion or other. Now, if you follow the story in Acts as if it were history, it presents endless problems. Now, you mentioned about the bit where the almost the end of his story where he comes into Rome. Now, let's just pick up the story there. He has spent two years in Caesarea, in a prison, apparently, but then he gets on this, this strange claim, but I am a Roman. He gets presented, you know, the idea is he must go before Caesar. So although the charge is far from clear on what basis he goes anywhere, he's put on a boat and it goes off towards Rome, gets shipwrecked. Now, the interesting thing about the, the voyage to Rome not only is, does it parallel something in the life of Josephus, the first century historian, but even on its own merits, if you consider Paul in that story, he is, though a prisoner, he is dominating the voyage. So that when the ship gets into trouble, he tells the sailors not to launch the lifeboat, right? He keeps them on board and and, it, and then they get shipwrecked, right? And they're all saved. And that, at this point, you get this strange paradox that Paul, a prisoner, is the most dominant character there. And then he, you come to the, the, the episode where he comes into Italy, supposedly. Crowds come out to you know, to greet the guy like it's Michael Jackson in town, right? And and <laughs> and you think, well, how did they know he was coming? He's been in prison for two years. He was shipwrecked for months. And they, they weren't to know in hit Italy where this guy is, is coming from. But he arrives and then suddenly there is a crowd to, to, to meet and greet him. And, and, you know, and you just have to think about that. He lands at Putoli. You know, it's 150 miles from Rome. Just so did they travel for a fortnight to, to, to meet this guy? And so if you try and interpret that story in historical terms, just nothing actually works. None of it adds up. So, you know, we go, we go from, you know, that situation uh, to one in which... Um, uh, we, we then have a situation where what happens to him? We don't know. The Acts to the Apostles, as you say, finishes him with him renting his own house, but it obviously is not some little grotty uh, apartment in a, in, a, in a tenement block because he entertains uh, visitors, he preaches as, as, as he will, and uh, uh, he, he, he holds, the, holds court before the Jewish leaders and, and convinces half of them. You know, you, you just cannot fit this story into reality. And, and, and even, even the writer of this story doesn't finish the story off in any satisfactory way. It just stops at that point. And I think he just ran out of steam at that point. It, it, it done the it used Paul for the essential task of why Paul was moved to Rome, and the idea was, in doing that 
that transfer, he was giving Rome a, a link to the, the to the gospel, and, uh, and and so the Roman Church could take over uh, the the the. the uh, the, the the pageant the story and, and it became a roman church roman christianity as opposed to palestinian christianity so paul is uh, attributed to uh founding churches is that correct like uh, very much like peter well supposedly so supposedly so that is another dimension to paul and um if if we put that story to you know in, in it again in its context, in learn of Paul, what does he begin? With? He begins with a, 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 as a, as a, a, a zealot Jew who, who who persecutes the church. Well, that's the first bit of nonsense. We don't have anything that substantiates that story. It's simply a Christian tale that that's how he began, right? But after his conversion, he goes off around the world. He makes these various journeys. He first of all goes to Cyprus. And again, there's no nothing that substantiates, substantiates that Paul was ever in Cyprus, but the story is there. He goes to Cyprus. And who does he convert? He converts the governor of the island. Now, you know, that, that, that's, again, an extraordinary claim. The governor of the island becomes a Christian. But that bit gets dropped out. It's not re reiterated anywhere else. So it's, it, it, you know, each step of the journey, and I've tried to follow this journey on, you know, in reality, I've tried to follow this story as much as I can. And, and none of it really adds up when you actually <laughs> spell out what is claimed. When you, if you read it quickly and believe this fairy tale in your head, then yes, you maybe you have faith. But if you try and test it in, in the real context, None of it will work. None of it will work. And it is simply symbolic. Well, what is the symbolism? The symbolism is this is the supreme evangelical of, for the early church. You know, here, here is someone who is, is the best that could be. A, pers a, pers a persecutor turned persecuted. Yes, yes, that's right. He, 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 the persecutor becomes the perfect Christian. Yeah, and and uh, well, it, it, you see the the Jews don't mention Paul. Paul's no no found in that in, in the Jewish scripture. You know, as so much. Um, so who was Paul? It, it, who was Paul as the persecutor? I mean, under what authority? And 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 what 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 was Paul doing as the persecutor? Who did he work for? Why was he the persecutor in the first place? Well, that's, that, that is again, isn't it? Why is Paul is introduced to the story as a young man, right? So that is the only indication we have of his age. As a young man, he is holding the coats of, of the people who are stoning Stephen, right? The first Christian martyr, right? right? The first Christian martyr, he's holding their coats. Now... And it says he approved, right? He approved. It's like watching a beheading by ISIS. You know, he approves of what's happening. Now he is catapulted from that position, which he watches as a young man, to the chief persecutor of the Christians. Now that's an oddity, because you think, hang on, there was a variety of beliefs among the Jews. A huge variety, in actual fact, when we look closely at it. But for some reason, there is an official persecution of the of, of the new Christians. So you think, well, that exists in, in the fable that the Christians write, but there's nothing to substantiate that anywhere else. But anyway, this young man is appointed by the chief priest, right, by the chief priest to persecute the, the the christians and wh who does he choose to persecute he chooses the christians that are 150 miles away in damascus <laughs> now you think well, hang on what about the ones in galilee well the the the, the, the actually apostles actually excludes them you know 
the other Christians apparently, because of the persecution, had to scatter, but the gospel, the, the apostles stay in, in, in Jerusalem, right? Which is odd. But Paul, nonetheless, he thinks, I'll go and get those in, in Damascus. Now, that presents several problems, one of which is the distance, second one of which is what authority did the church, or sorry, the, the chief priest have to issue instructions to anyone to go into another Roman province and a major city, right, and arrest Christians, right? It, it just doesn't make sense. It only makes sense in the context of the theological argument where way to Damascus, Paul sees a vision, gets thrown from his horse, and he's told, you know, you know, uh, you know, why are you persecuting me? You know, this is what Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? And he is momentarily made blind, and, and he, he then is led into D Damascus, where he is baptised, you know. Now, the story is patently theological. It's a story told to illustrate the purpose of this this persecutor becoming a christian right this major persecutor becoming the perfect christian and that and that that's the purpose of the story because history doesn't support although later christians invented bits and pieces to substantiate that story it doesn't hold up it doesn't hold up so that's where he comes as a persecutor well, tell me the rest of the story. Okay, on th this Damascus road, he gets thrown from his horse. He has his vision. He's blinded by the vision. And then he has to what? He, If I'm not mistaken, he's got to go find this other character who can baptize him, lay hands on him, and restore his eyesight. Absolutely. So here we have, so what do we have to do? What would any writer have to do? You have to introduce another character, Anius, right? who happens to be a Christian in, in Damascus. They introduce this character. So here you've got an established church in Damascus. And bear in mind at what early stage this is. There's no Gospels in existence. There's nothing else, you know. And this guy himself has a vision. You know, and, the, and, and he has a vision of what of Paul's vision. And he gets told that's what he's got to do. He's got to go and bleed this, this apostle or this future apostle into Damascus and it, 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 and 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 baptize him to, to 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 become a Christian and and where does Paul get his knowledge then from this persecutor because he obviously didn't know Jesus himself you know and the answer is well it's communications it's communications by Christ tells Paul what to believe and you know and and it, it, the rest of it he figures out from Scripture. So this is where Paul gets his, 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 his orientation from. But you see, he's not just any old Christian. He then becomes the foremost Christian. He's the foremost Christian. And oddly enough, why don't they all just live happily ever after in Damascus then? Well, the answer is, ah, well, either Aratus, the king of Damascus, or the local governor, or, or, or the local Jews, they were out to get him, right? So this is full... Paul's first encounter with, with, you know, dastardly Jews who are out to murder him. And the answer, he has to, in a very theatrical, almost pantomime fashion, he has to escape the city in a basket, right? Doesn't just get on a horse and ride away. No, he has to be lowered over the wall in a basket, even while the Jews are guarding all the gates of the city day and night. But he slips out in a very theatrical way on, in his basket. You know, now, and he happily returns to Jerusalem and joins the apostles then. So this whole story, you think, well, yes, if we're trying to tell a, a tale to a child, it might, you know, fill up five or ten minutes. But, you know, to present this as anything, you know, uh, creditable as, as a historical event, it's just it's plain rubbish. It's just plain rubbish. It's not even worthy of any, any consideration as an historical episode. <laughs> but that was just the start of Paul. You see, whilst I don't uh, 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 offhand regard Paul as an impossible character, because we have the letters of Paul, and some of them might be authentic or some of them were some of them certainly were written by somebody 
who may have been someone called Paul. That's possible. So I don't immediately say Paul doesn't exist, although that's very tempting. But when you start to examine the story, it falls over. It falls over at each and every point of the story. If you examine each and every point of the story, it, it, it just is it just is not credible. Whether it's the shipwreck or, or the uh, you know he's he, you know one of the on his first or is it his second journey he he gets stoned, stoned and left for dead by Jews from Iconium in in, in Asia Minor, right? What happens? He gets up and goes off for more missionary activity. So. You know, what is that? A resurrection? Is he resurrected? I mean, Jews have fought, taken two weeks to find him and, and, and yet and they stone him and yet somehow they make a mistake. He's not actually dead. In fact, he's so well, he can go off missionizing the, you know, the very next day. I mean, that's how the story hangs together about Paul. It just doesn't work. Now, OK, what would a Christian say? Well, it's not meant to be taken literally or it's not not meant it, it entirely historical but none of it is historical but what they have from this is this character who gets more and more important his paul's importance grows all the time because he's off you know st establishing churches he's, he's off on his missionary journeys he's converting whole provinces of the roman empire and then of course not only does he write out most of christian theology but he, he, he goes to Rome and has a martyr's death in Rome, all without a shred of evidence, all without a shred of evidence. Speaking so, of, yes, it's tempting to think there was somebody. Speak, but speaking, of, who. speaking of the martyrdom and speaking of the idea that there may be somebody, we'll get to the martyrdom in a moment, his execution, which is curious all in, in itself. Um do is it true, Ken, that there are examples? Now, I don't, I don't have verification of this, but I have heard, and it wouldn't surprise me one bit. But is it true that there are examples where the church has actually fabricated various documents so that they can then later on retroactively use those documents as verification for one thing or another? Well, that has certainly happened in the history of the church and in spades. I mean, yes, there, it, it, there has been a, um, uh, there's no question about the forgeries within Christianity. Let me, I must switch off that television for a second. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, so the reason I asked that question, just to keep the uh, audience, to keep the ball rolling, um, when Ken was mentioning that we have the letters of Paul. So, <laughs> so Ken, when you were mentioning that, you know, we have the letters of Paul, and obviously somebody wrote the letters, and you didn't automatically discount Paul as a, as a man who may have done things. And um, so this is why I asked that question, because I'm pretty sure that uh, the church has, in fact, forged a document so that they can then later on go back and say, well, we have the letters here, we have these documents, and therefore that proves this part of the story. Yeah. In, in regard to Paul, of course, we, this, this is a question of, of, of what is actually what was actually written by a person who may have been called Paul. And we already have to distinguish between authentic and inauthentic epistles. There's 13 epistles uh, that, that, that sometimes are ascribed to Paul, and yet they are questionable whether they were ever actually written by, by, by someone of that name, right? Because they serve purposes that meet the needs of the church in the second century. There's nothing that places them retrievably in the first century at all. So there are pastoral epistles, there are, there are uh, prison epistles, there are Catholic epistles. Now, you know, a Catholic epistle is written to the entire church. Now, that doesn't sound like a, the, the beginnings of a church, does it? If you write, you know, it it's almost presupposes a massive movement that grew, grew overnight. But if it did, nobody noticed. That's the thing, isn't it? Nobody noticed this explosive growth of the church that supposedly happened but you know coming from the point of view of 
the new te- the, the, the the acts of the apostles you had the impression you know within weeks the church which was only 120 strong uh, at, at the time of the uh, just after the crucifixion then becomes several thousand within weeks and and you you then get the conversion of whole cities whole cities if not whole provinces you know we, Philip the deacon conv- converted the whole of Samaria. You know, this, this sort of thing. Well, what credence does that have? You know, it, 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 very little is the answer. Very little, because uh, these stories just, uh, well, there's fantasy stories. People do not, uh, do not change like that. Let's Consider the fact that Paul goes into a town, gives a sermon, and leaves with a fully-fledged church existing there. Now, that is the proposition that you come to again and again in the the Acts of the Apostles. And yet, you would know, anyone would know, if people have had an ancestral religion that they've had for centuries, would one strange even charismatic Jewish holy man wandering into town and giving a, a, a sermon immediately converts somebody such that he could leave and their faith would be secure and, 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 and that that church would prosper. You know, it is just nonsense. And to think that Paul did this when there were many rival religions to Christianity, many rival religions which had many of the same claims, much of the same, you know, mythological claims. It it it, it is a, a, the whole thing has been written uh, later than claimed for it. It has been written and then back projected into an earlier century, placed before the Jewish war. That was the essential need, placed before. The uh, whilst the temple still existed before the Rome's Rome had obliterated Jerusalem, and it 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 it, it, it allowed any claims to be made because you could argue well it all got lost in the war we can't provide the records it's all lost in the war but this belongs before that time and so in the second century the church began to fabricate its needs and among those needs were certain epistles written but given the name of Paul. So we could say by that stage, there was somebody who had sufficient kudos with other people writing in his name, and they could pass pass these materials off as Paul's. And one of the first to do that that we have evidence for is Marcion, the the early bishop of the church, who set up a rival church, the, the, the official church or the Catholic church, and uh, he was the first person who, who, who produced this uh, a set of Pauline epistles. Um, and you know, someone like Justin Martyr in the middle of the second century had never heard of Paul, right? But, uh, but you know, Martin had popularised the idea there was this Paul character uh, perhaps 20 years earlier. And by the end of the second century, this Paul and 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 all those people have contributed to the story of Paul. Um, you know, it's fully fledged by the end of the second century. Tell me about Paul in Athens. How is it that this guy goes to Athens? Has a, a some? He wanders into Athens and he has a meeting with the Athenian philosophers, and within what one or two short meetings, what couple of days at a few conversations he he out philosophizes them ultimately he leaves athens and what nothing happens no churches founded no christianity founded what happens there well that you, you you've said it in a nutshell that really is the story of paul and athens i mean let's put it in context athens was past its grand days but it but the romans you know valued wrote uh, c- c- Greek culture for sure, and it had a special role as as a, a, a center of philosophy and and rationality. Now, the Christian Church obviously had to meet and defeat the philosophers of of, of Greece. You know, they had to rebut 
the 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 that school of thought which dismissed anything that came out of Jerusalem, uh, you know, Judea and, and and Christianity as as simply superstitious nonsense, right? But but so Paul serves the role in Athens of defeating that idea. Um, yes, he has to go to the Areopagus, this 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 place where he gives a sermon, a big rock that faces the uh, the, the, the 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 hill in central Athens, and well. It's, it's quite curious because the Athenian philosophers almost act as the local police in this. It's this story from Paul or in the Acts of the Apostles. They arrest him and take him to the Areopagus where he's on trial, right? He's on trial. But, of course, in his own magical fashion, he delivers a sermon <laughs> telling them that they are the, the, the superstitious ones, that he knows who their unknown god is. And, and so there's a sort of... Uh, a sort of a little bit of sleight of hand in here because uh, the, the, the philosophers didn't worship a, an unknown god. You know, the, the Epicureans were essentially atheistic. You know, the Stoics were much different. You know, so this idea that that, that, that in, in a one in a sort of a one one shot, Paul defeats the Athenians and dismisses them as superstitious it's just well it's just ridiculous it's just it turns reality on its head and the, the truth of the pudding is yes there was no church founded in athens for at least 300 years and and uh, uh, and the other the stories presented in the acts of apostles are it's a complete invention so yes in each particular place this same character paul achieves an, an essential goal of the church whether it's defeating philosophy in Athens or proving himself a martyr in Rome. You know, they're, they're all parts of the same story, uh, which after one or two instances, you realise is, is overblown because why is it all on Paul? Didn't Jesus come to earth and, and you know, elect 12 men, good and strong, and, and, and for, for spreading his gospel. That, where's that gone? That's gone out the window, isn't it? It's now all about Paul. Paul doing, Paul doing that. But with the essential purpose, it shifts the drama ultimately into Rome and makes Paul a Roman. So if I could digress uh, momentarily, Paul is the first uh, apostle, epistle, apostle, Paul is the first to write about Jesus. Is that correct? He's the literally the first person, um, chronologically, he's supposed to be the first to have written about Jesus. Well, yes, the Pauline epistles are regarded as, as earlier, the earliest source material, earliest Christian material. That's absolutely true. Paul, when whoever it was, Paul uh, was writing. Um, he is unaware of the Gospels. So there's no references to the Gospels at all in Paul, right? And it's surprised in, in, in its sense that this man who claims to be the apostle for Jesus actually invents most of what he says himself. He doesn't talk about a virgin birth. He doesn't talk about... Uh, the missions of, of Jesus. He doesn't talk about a, a, anything that Jesus might have, 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 have preached. Nothing like that. No, no. It, Apparently, it, he didn't he, know that Jesus was a healer. That he was a um, uh, um, um, what's what's the word I'm I'm looking for? Um, uh, an exorcist. Uh, that he performed miracles. That he had a ministry. That he had followers. Apparently, Paul didn't know any of these things. And, he did know, and, and if you, yeah, yes, right. And on his Damascus All you road, have to do is... <laughs> so you you said that Paul was unaware of the Gospels. So um, at what point on, because his Damascus road experience, when he describes his conversation with Jesus, uh, after he has he falls off his horse and he he has this vision, this revelation, he 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 goes into Rome and or goes into Damascus, goes into Rome territory, and he says, "Well, I give to you what was given to me, and also what I've gotten from the Gospels, right? Or Scripture? That was the word he said. Scripture. 
Yeah, scripture is one thing, gospels are another. Right. Paul, Paul often, re, Paul, Paul does refer to Jewish scripture, but he means Jewish scripture. In other words, pre-Christian scripture. Gotcha. Um, but bear in mind that Paul himself, if we assume that Paul is the author of the uh, epistles, right, makes no mention of this this conversion experience on the road to Damascus. Paul himself doesn't mention that. It's it's the author of the of the book of Acts of the Apostles who tells that story. That colourful, ridiculous story comes from the book of Acts. Paul does refer to Damascus because he says, "I, you know, he 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 had spent some time there," but he doesn't uh, tell that story of falling off his horse and seeing the light and hearing the oh, words and the rest of it. That's a dead giveaway. <laughs> that's a that's a nail in the <laughs> coffin, Paul has this Damascus Road experience and doesn't mention it in any of his own writings? Really? That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. <laughs> You've got to remember the the Bible is, is a, an assembled work which the church wants you to believe is assembled a certain way. So the Gospels come before the epistles, right? So you learn this story before you get to the epistles. But they were written in the other order, right? The, 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 you have the early beliefs represented in the, the epistles, where none, not only just the Pauline epistles, but the others as well, none of them, none of them mention anything about the human Jesus story. None of them mention anything about that. Nothing about his birth. Nothing about his trial. Nothing about his, his crucifixion, the trial, and so on. None of that. But they, so they come. They come before the, the, those uh, uh, late, later works. And so, but they, they but they, in the Bible, they're put after. In the same way, within the Gospels, you don't get Mark put first. Because then it would give away the fact that Mark says some sort of very simple things, and then you get the later gospelers embellish and edit and, and redact what he has written. So, but they put Matthew first. So you get exposed to that idea of virgin birth uh, 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 and, and other claims before you, 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 so it stops you seeing the the story and the way in which it developed. And that's the whole thing about understanding Christianity. The story developed over time, over time. Scholars still argue, of course, and will argue forever over in what order they were written and, and, and when they were written. But we have, you see, we have no clear evidence of either. No, they're not dated. We don't know that nobody's ascribed a name, you know, uh, nobody repeats who wrote it. They, they, those titles, the Gospel according to Matthew, the Gospel according to Luke, were added on at the end of the second century by the church, right? But they weren't written that way. The, doc the documents are anonymous. So we don't know where and when and by whom they were written. And, and that story is like a later edition. Early, early, the early letters suggest a philosophy or a, a, an ideology very different from what emerged the early stuff was about what, what who does paul talk about he doesn't really talk about jesus of nazareth he, he talks about the lord christ jesus the lord christ jesus or or christ the jesus you know the lord it, it, it's 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 a different stress because we're talking about a celestial jesus we're not talking about a human jesus who kicked around some little village called nazareth so it is important to get those documents in the order in which they are were written, and then you can see clearly how the story was embellished and developed. You know, I'm glad you mentioned the Celestial Jesus because I am somewhat of a fan of Richard Carrier's work. I was wondering what you thought of his, his position on this subject in particular, um, as Carrier describes it, that, um, that Paul... Uh, like we already mentioned, didn't know anything about Jesus's ministry, his his miracle working, his exorcisms, his following, his his founding of churches or whatever. Didn't seem to know anything about Jesus, and he never even talks about Jesus except for when he has a conversation with Jesus. He's literally talking about 
and I'm putting this in quotations because Carrier, this is how he phrases it, he says, Space Jesus, because he's referring to the third heaven, right? So Paul never mentions... Mm -hmm. No, Paul never mentions anyone seeing or talking to Jesus. Paul never mentions anybody who knew Jesus. Paul's only experience with Jesus was with what he referred to as the third heaven. And the only time he mentions anyone seeing Jesus is after his death, after the death of Jesus. Right? Is that all correct? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's essentially so. That's essentially so. I have no problem with what, with what Carrier writes. Um, yes, it, it, it's Christians will rebut the well. The, 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 let me say, put it this way: apologists have learned this stuff and, and still go on to defend Christianity. They 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 raise objections all the way along the line because they, they, you know they, 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 they are, if they admitted it, they, that's giving up the game, isn't it? So they have to defend these things. So the sixty thousand words in the the epistles. Now, there's a couple of references that you could, and Christians do, apologists do, claim Paul is referring to a human Jesus, right? Thing about Jesus is born, born of a woman, right? Now, that's like saying, do you know Elvis Presley? You say, yes, he, his mother, you know, he was born of a woman. You just think that's a silly comment. Everyone who's born is born of a woman. What does that prove? But it was said because it's trying to establish the point, this man was really born. He's not a phantom in the sky. You know, he's not a celestial Jesus. He really was born. And that's added in. You know, they've redacted that bit into the story to, to sort of, so they can come back and say, oh, no, 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 they, they, they pull. The reason why none of these epistle right, none of these early Christians mention a word about the Nazareth story well, they all knew it. They all knew it anyway. And, you know, and if you were writing to somebody, would you necessarily mention this or that? So they had, that's their rationale for getting out of that. But it's, it's, it's not convincing because in, in such a body of work, the omission is so huge that it, that it, that it, that it screams, you know, it screams what the truth is. Um, would you also agree with Carrier? I have another quotation in my notes here. He, Carrier says that the epistles of Paul, in his mind, are the strongest argument for the non-existence of Jesus, because we don't see uh, the charismatic man with a following, like we've already mentioned. What we see is, according to Paul, a celestial angel, and, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, Paul referred to Jesus as an archangel, just uh, like uh, Gabriel or, or Michael or, or some of the other archangels. Um, and Carrier says, uh, revealing himself to people in dreams and hallucinations. So in, in Carrier's, uh, from his position, he says that the epistles of Paul are the strongest argument for the non-existence of Jesus. Would you agree with that? Or do you have, you have a better, mm -hmm. you have something better that you would say might be a, no, a, a good, no. or, a good I, or better? I, 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 would, I would agree that they are powerful evidence for the non-existence of Jesus. I would agree with that. Absolutely. Um <laughs> Not only would you expect someone if you if you if there really was a man and 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 obviously if if the story is is there's Jesus and he gets crucified and it just so happens that Paul turns up afterwards just you know he's supposedly a very you know the most zealous of Jews but somehow he misses this fact that Jesus is going around uh, converting and preaching and so on he misses him but uh, thereafter he doesn't doesn't find out any information from his disciples or anything like that no he says pointedly he says it in galatians he says you know i learned none of this from any man you know i got it from revelation meaning he dreamt it up and he got it from scripture which means he read jewish scripture and interpreted it a certain way so yes that is where Paul's coming from. You know, it, it, so the point is, is made doubly strong. Yes, it is true. Excellent. Do you have just um, just off the cuff here? What do you what do, what do you think would be uh, an equally good or another e uh, a good argument for the non-existence? I mean, after all, your your YouTube channel, your book, your website, Jesus never existed. So that's a pretty bold statement. Um, besides Paul, what do we have in in, in as a strong evidence that Jesus really never did exist. 
Well, you, yeah, there are so many ways you could approach that question. For, for example, um, nobody, let's take a simple one, a very simple one. Nobody describes Jesus, right? Nobody describes Jesus. No, you know, you'd think somebody somewhere would make a description about him. We know what he looks like, of course, because that image has been refined over thousands of years. We know, we, 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 we know he's a slender, long, you know, sort of brownish sort of hair, you know, a certain thin face, you know, gentle, serious look on his mind, you know. And yet none of the early Christians bothered to describe a man at all. There's no evidence for their, of, a, 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 you know, a, a, of a physical. Now, that is unusual. If, if there was some charismatic person in the world today, you would get hundreds of descriptions of him. Okay, you would get photographs, of course, but even without that, you would get hundreds of descriptions of this sort of person, but you get none of that with Jesus. So there's a simple proof, simple proof that, you know, why is that? Why could it be that, that he, he, he didn't exist? And then when you look, for, look at the very earliest images presented for Jesus, do they have? Well, it looks damn like Apollo, right? The last sun god, right? A last sun god, you know, suddenly Jesus looks like Apollo, right? The stories are slightly different now, but... He's still there. You know, he's, he's got the grapes of Dionysus. He's got, he's, he carries the lamb and so on. But, you know, it, 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 so there's another parallel there, you know, that, that, where, where, where this, this comes from. Um, where else can we turn? Uh, Jesus never writes anything, right? You're supposedly uh, 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 on a mission from God. Right? A mission from God to bring the most important message uh, to the world in its entire existence. You know, believe in me and, and, and you'll be saved. All right. But he writes nothing, nothing at all. And that's an odd thing for a, a guru, isn't it? Certainly. You know? Yeah, that's a damn <laughs> odd thing, isn't it? He writes absolutely nothing. We have nothing except the only thing we have on Jesus is what other people talk about, that Jesus said this and Jesus did that. Jesus, yeah. uh, we have nothing have ask, from the man himself. Right, that's interesting. Yeah. Thousands of people supposedly saw him, cured by him, were, saw his miracles and so on. None of them reports anything. None of them reports anything. And, and, and yet, when do we get stories about Jesus? The gospel stories are decades later. Right. Decades later. And they're not written in Aramaic. They're not written in Hebrew. They're written in Greek. Yeah? Now, isn't that a bit odd? Isn't that a bit odd? You know, <laughs> the, a, 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 it takes a Greek to write this fabulous story decades later. Decades later. You know, no Jew bothered to write or record anything and there were educated jews there were some educated jews so no jew bothered to write anything it required greeks to do that job doesn't that make you wonder doesn't that make you wonder where and why we got this story doesn't it perhaps make more sense that the original tao came after the jewish war which had destroyed jerusalem and and, and laid waste most of judea right that time of desperation that somebody wrote a, an encouraging tale of salvation that although things are bad they will be better right that the lord god has not forsaken you he will remember you and you know you will be redeemed and he writes that up as a little allegory that can be acted out in, in 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 village squares with a two or three actors you know very easily it's it's you know if you you can interpret that original story as yeah, a cipher for the fate of israel israel had been destroyed but it would be restored and there's a you know and the, and it's getting captured in that little story that's why all the scenes in that story are very brief jesus arrives jesus says something Jesus leaves, the locals were aghast. 
the geo locals were astonished. And so therefore, you know, again, it's, it's another indication. What we're dealing with here is a fairy story, a tale, a tale to make people have hope, to give people encouragement. And it, it's developed more from it's developed more from that. When the later gospel writers came along, they they added in a bit of historical drama to to uh, pad it out to make it seem like it was an authentic happening, but it wasn't. It's 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 it's, it's allegory that's been misused and turned into faux faux history. Well, it's certainly been refined, rewritten, retranslated, reinterpreted, refined and refined and refined. There are definitely some really, I would say, in some cases, genius level literary devices within the Bible. But at the same time, Ken, when I try to read the Bible, and I have tried to read it cover to cover. Now, I've, I've looked at and read uh, many sections and portions but when I try to read the Bible cover to cover, I can't get through it because it is filled with monumental, mind-numbing redundancy. Let alone the internal contradictions. That's separate. The To me, the mind-numbing redundancy, in fact, in some cases, just reading one paragraph consisting of only three or four sentences, they'll say the same thing three or four times. I agree. I always found that annoying it's, when I tried to get through that. It's mind-numbingly redundant. What, what's going on there? Mm. Well, it is a very simple story, and if you took out the redundancy, you, it would be very brief indeed. I mean, <laughs> take the crucifixion and take the crucifixion in, in 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 Mark, where it began, right? And it basically says, and they took him out and crucified him. And he was crucified. <laughs> and the next sentence is, and he was crucified. Don't tell you where, when, <laughs> how, you know, who, what. Then he, you know, and, 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 you know, the later Gospels write, write a little bit more, but nothing much. I mean, I mean, <laughs> in a way, you could read it all in an afternoon, for sure. It's, 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 and yet you have entire libraries fill up with, filled up today with commentaries, you know, Devoted Christians will devote, you know, give a lifetime to uh, embellish some silly story. And, and you know, if you were a, a, a medieval um, theologian, of course, you had a good living uh, dwelling on these points of what did God mean when he, when, he, when he said go? You know, what did he really mean by that? You know, you, 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 yes, it's a simple story. It's a simple fairy tale. <laughs> uh it it, it it clings on by the by the, the the flimsiest of threads nowadays. I mean, you know, very few. I mean, I have a couple of very good Catholic friends, right? I do a couple of good, very Catholic friends, and they 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 are devoted to their church, but they they don't engage in the debate with me over the history of it. They just tell me, well, you just can't you accept the the good the good bits? Yeah, never mind about whether it's true or accurate. Just accept the good bits. Like love everybody. Isn't that a good thing? Love everybody. Oh yeah, yeah. We 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 we'll believe because we love everybody. Yeah. I, Except they don't. <laughs> it, do, it doesn't belong in the twenty first century. Put it that way. Yeah, they they love everybody except those people and those people and those people and those people. I mean, come on. Everybody, everybody except the out group. Yes, everybody except yeah. everybody except every everybody that isn't in our group. I mean, That's basically yeah, it. Yeah. So, um, okay, so before we shift gears away from Paul, um, um, we'll go ahead and get into Jesus. But I'm curious about John the Baptist. One of the things, another thing that's always stuck in my craw for many years is why and bloody hell would the God-man, the son of the creator of the universe, why would he need to be baptized? And who the hell was John the Baptist anyway? Mm -hmm. Well, a very valid question for sure. Yeah, the valid question for sure. I think any question like that, you have to remind yourself, this story that we know has been developed over time, right? 
the version that sticks in our mind is often the finished version the the, the, the you know the the seventeenth edit you know and that's the one we think is true but if you go back to the first if you try and recapture the the first uh, uh, stories of John the Baptist well into an area where Mark tells us that John was baptizing, right? That's more or less the introduction of John was baptizing. And Jesus comes along and uh, uh, John the Baptist baptizes him, right? He's a man. Jesus is a man at this stage. And a voice from heaven booms out. It's God, of course. God is speaking. And he says, this is my son and I'm well pleased with him, right? Now, this was a form of early Christianity known as adoptionism. A man is adopted by God to be his means of, of acting in the world, right? So, now that is an early form of Christianity which was superseded by the idea this son of God was always the son of God. It wasn't a man adopted by God to be his son of God. Therefore, in later editions, namely in Matthew and in Luke, it gets changed, doesn't it? It gets changed that, that uh, uh, Jesus is, in the first instance, the, 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 the Matthew has Jesus argue with, uh, has John the Baptist argue with Jesus? He, he actually says, why should I baptize you? You, 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 don't, you don't baptize him. And Jesus gives a wonderful reply, typical of the sort of nonsense you have in, in, in the Bible. Jesus says, to fulfill all righteousness. Now, that's his reply. That's, why, that's what Jesus says to John the Baptist, why he should be baptized by him. Fulfill all righteousness. And you think, hmm, not sure I... I quite understand what he's saying here. In later Gospels, namely in Luke and, and, and in, in, in John, well, in John in particular, the whole baptism scene is dropped out. He doesn't have Jesus baptised by, by John. That, you know, he doesn't do that. So here is a story because Jesus has gone from man to demigod to God, progression through the Gospels, so that story, which once was valid enough, you know, it's like Jesus is any man. Any man is chosen by God. From that, he becomes son of God, brought down from heaven, you know. And by the time we get to John's gospel, is God himself. He's, he's you know, he's, he's part of the Trinity. So this is why the, you, you have to, in any story, like with the baptism sequence, you have to see in its history the story itself evolved through time you know and um, how one thing which was embarrassing at one stage or wasn't embarrassing at one stage becomes embarrassing at another interesting uh talk to me briefly about this place in israel called yardenet is, is that how it's pronounced mm. yardenet <laughs> this yeah, as, as i know yeah founded in no later than 1981 as literally a tourist spot go ahead tell me about that well <laughs> yeah you can't blame the israelis for maximizing their tourist industry can you i mean you know <laughs> to, you know <laughs> Every nation does it. Every nation does it. I was speaking once to uh, uh, a Jordanian uh, archaeologist about the fact that he knew some claim or other made uh, for the gospel was was rubbish. But he, he said, "Well, how, how, how can he how can he publicise the fact that it wasn't true when it so much in, you know tourism comes from the very fact that they they had this centre, you know?" So yeah. He, he, you know, you're talking about today, you're talking about people's livelihood. You don't want to send them away and lose money and put everybody out of work and so on. So very practical issues come into it. Now, this was the case of Yardenit. You know, the, you know, everybody wants to, every Christian wants to share in this holy experience, don't they? Now, the fact is, historically, the places they've claimed for John the Baptist's uh, 
uh, activity has varied over time, depending. Now, Yardenic happened because the war between the Arabs and the Israelis had shut the, the, the frontier near the other site, and so that was closed down. And so they simply opened up another site with all the appropriate props for what would look like you know, a nice uh, baptism centre. Uh, it's the same way in Nazareth. You can't find anything historical in Nazareth. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 but so then now that they've created a Disney, Disney World type fake city of, of, of a town of Nazareth. So what do you have? You have peasants wandering around. You have a few donkeys. You know, you have a classical Hollywoodized version of what the New Testament landscape would look like. And it just keeps the tourists happy, doesn't it? No, I mean, <laughs> I prefer to go to real historical sites, but if you can't can't be bothered to do that, but you can be happy with a fake one, well, be happy with a fake one. So that's a, that's the story behind you, Danny. But there, you know, if you go back to the earlier one, perhaps you know, the time of the Byzantines, I mean, you have a map there, the ma ma the ma uh, murder Merhaba map, um, it, it, which is on the floor of a church in, 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 in uh, Jordan. And the places that the gospel, or at least the gospel of John claims for the baptism of John, it, it, it's, it's, was referred to as Bethany beyond the Jordan. But even in the, in the fourth century, they couldn't find this place. So they used a different town, Bethabara, which was actually on the other side of the river. And that became the authentic site. And, it, and you realise, well, nobody would know anywhere where somebody baptised someone. I mean, come on, you know, it's somewhere, somewhere on the riverbank, presumably, if he did it at all. But it could have been anywhere. And, 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 and it worked. what sites did they attract? Well, they chose historically relevant sites to themselves, where, say, the Israelites had passed into the Promised Land. That's where they set up the, one of the earlier baptism sites. You know, it's the, the idea... Israelites passing into, into into the promised land sort of has a parallel with with Jesus coming for, you know with the new the new Israel and the new dispensation so yeah it makes a certain sense it's not what I, uh, well it's not what I would let me put it this way it's not true it's not history it's more astounding there rubbish. it is there it is got my sound bite <laughs> thank you uh Oh, that makes that makes the whole interview worth it right there. Um, <laughs> I am I am curious though. Um, I mean, you know, we've got this character John the Baptist. He's running around baptizing people, ostensibly, presumably in the name of Yahweh. Uh, and and what 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 gives him the idea? Why baptism? What's what's with the ritual? Well, of baptizing? I think if you, yeah, is it not? Well, pagan? I think you could. I mean, doesn't it well, have it, roots in paganism, from, right? Death and rebirth, this well, whole yes, cycle does, of life it thing? Comes from, it comes from India, I would say. Probably there's more evidence that it came, came from from the East than, than anywhere else. And you, there is good evidence that Buddhist monks, among others, and certain, you know, monks or evangelicals from, from the East came came into, the, into, the, into Palestine and... Uh, introduced the notion of baptism, uh, a, a sort of ritual ho ritual cleanliness. I mean, if you remember, the Bible goes out of its way. The Gospels go out of its way. So John didn't baptize for the remission of sins, but for bodily purity. I mean, it, 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 it's, yeah, the idea that, you know, in the presence of God, his spiritual presence, you should be clean, I think, yeah, would, would have early, quite early uh, antecedents, that's for sure. So the Jews, the Jews adopted, you know, uh, ritualized, the ritualized bath, you know, and, and, and to be clean in the presence of God. Yes, they had a real thing, of course, about ritual cleanliness. You know, if you touched a corpse, corpse, you couldn't attend the, 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 the temple. You know, uh, you know, uh, a, a woman was often unclean for because of a monthly cycle. And, and you know they, 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 so cleanliness was an an issue with the Jews for sure. Um, now and, and, I, and I think there's good evidence to suppose there was a person called John the Baptist. Josephus mentions John, a good man who did baptisms, and so you know we have evidence that there was such a person. Now I think the important thing to know about John the Baptist 
Yes. Christianity had to deal with this rival cult, this rival cult that was established. And that's why, in a peculiar fashion, really, every mention of John has him saying how he is just the forerunner, just, you know, there's one greater than him just around the corner, just wait and see. I'm uh, you know, someone who will bring something more than I am. You know, so this is idea. And what John is doing, what, you know, if you just take the normal clash of, of early empires, if you defeated an enemy, your God also defeated his God. Now, one way you could do be one way you could represent that is destroying it entirely. But more typically, that defeated God would become a servant of your triumphant God. Uh -huh. So he becomes part of the pantheon, you know. So your lesser gods are serving him, and it just emphasizes your your victory and your dominance. And this is what happens with John the Baptist. John is given in the Christian holy book, not in their own holy book, in the Christian holy book. John is given these words to say, one greater than I is coming. You know, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and so on. And so he subordinates himself. The lovely reference is that one about, he could, you know, in John, I think, you know, uh, uh, he's, I'm not fit to tie up his shoelaces, basically. He really goes out of his way to finish and, uh, and denigrate himself in, in building up Jesus, because of course, it was a rival cult, as I say, and and uh, and interesting enough, it wasn't even defeated by Christianity. It went on for centuries. Why, well, you know, despite the fact that Jesus supposedly came along and and took over. Um, so yes, so it's not surprising that that, that, that this happened, and 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 all, all the way along the line, Christianity has had to meet the competition by um, by a mixture of direct assault and and integration of what the, what the enemy is saying so I'll put the I was going to type it out um, but I'll go ahead and just say it out loud for the audience if you have, if you guys have any questions for my guest Ken Humphreys uh, tag me in the live chat or put your question in all capital letters and I will field questions to Ken before we move on. Uh, as as we get more and deeper into the subject of Jesus himself, his, the man, his his workings, and um, and Ken's work. So I'll just say that I know there's a delay. It's usually about 15 or 20 seconds before I say something and people are able to respond. So I'll just banter on for a half a second here, and because I know that there probably are some questions, and I I told everybody in the chat a moment ago that I will be, begin to field questions. So everybody, um, if you have a question, tag me or put your questions in all cap, and I will field those questions to our guest. Um, in the meantime, this idea of birth, death, rebirth, um, it really sounds remarkably pagan. And as you mentioned, it was like, uh, what, a rival cult? And you said uh, likely there was there was uh, influences from uh, Eastern influences, uh, Hinduism, Um so what do you think of this idea that many, many people charge that Christianity today is literally nothing more than a revised version of old paganism? As I mentioned, the idea of birth, death, rebirth, and, the, you know, you alerted earlier that Christ was, you know, another Apollo. He's another in a long line of solar deities, which is, you know, has its roots in paganism. So uh, how do you respond to that? Well... Uh, the 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 only caveat I'd say is to say that it's nothing more than is, is perhaps a little bit uh, unjustified. It, Christianity here has made its its own uh, mythology as well as borrowing others. I mean that's the thing about uh, you know well it's been in existence for two thousand years or eighteen hundred years at least and. It, it, you know, it's, it's added to the stories itself. That's for sure. But many of many of the core beliefs are obviously of, 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 of ancient origin. I mean, you take the whole debate about oh, the origins of Easter, and and you have the you know a pagan god for Easter, and the, you know the, the 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 intrusion of Easter eggs as being fertility or 
Yule logs at Christmas and so on. You know, obviously, there's a lot of uh, uh, pagan ideas that can be traced within it, it within uh, Christianity, and it, even today. I mean, you you have uh, certain churches, uh, um, pay, you know, pay homage to their historical roots in a pre-Christian age. I mean, I think. Uh, uh, that sort of thing is um, apparent from, you know, Mexico and so on, or, or Africa, where earlier deities find their way into into the uh, into, into into the Christian cult. I mean, take the voodoo cult in Haiti. Uh, um, you know that there's obviously uh, um, a, a, a possibility of of synthesizing a, a sort of hybrid product. That's absolutely sure. I mean. If you take the the, the purpose of, of of religion, essentially provides charlatans with a living and and and, mm -hmm. and 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 provides a false hope to the believers. Well, those purposes are not compromised if you borrow something from the competition. One of the early cults, I think, that battled furiously with Christianity for centuries was. Mithraism, and Mithraism was very successful in the centuries, uh, uh, even in the Christian era, um, and a, a lot of its rituals have been borrowed by by the Christians. You know the the the, the, the you know uh, the, the the symbol of the cross. Uh, you know, baptizing somebody with a cross it seems to come from Mithraism. Uh, it's not unique to Christianity and its references to the crucifixion. And the the idea of a of a supper with the Lord. I mean, that was a very much a pagan idea. Um, if you were a devotee uh, 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 of a particular cult, you you would have occasions when you would all sit round at a ceremonial dinner, and the god would be present, whether symbolically in in the figure of, of a statue or. In, in some other spiritual form. So, yeah, there's a lot of, of paganism within Christianity, for sure. So, what when it comes to the story and the narrative that surrounds Jesus, what, what do you, what would you say is you, the perhaps the most bizarre, the most outlandish, the most non-believable, crazy, whatever... What what story? What what narrative of Jesus would comes to your mind that it would just stands out like a sore thumb as the craziest thing you've ever heard in in, in this narrative? Well, <laughs> that's a tricky one. It's all crazy. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot, isn't it's all there? Crazy. Yeah, it's all crazy. Well, take the Transfiguration, for example, in the, in the historical in the story of an historical Jesus, you know. He goes up a mountain and and, and he takes uh, P James, uh, Peter, James and John with him. He takes them because they are witnesses, you know, for what's going to happen. So they traipse up the mountain. And what happens, he, he turns into a, a vision of, of light or, you know, he, he, he's enveloped by white, white light. And, and lo and behold... Elijah and, and, and uh, who's the other guy? Mo Moses appear. You know, so, and, and, and I'll tell you the silliest thing of all, they talk with Jesus. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? What on earth did this God have to talk about on a mountaintop with these other two, you know, characters, Elijah and Moses? Aberrations. So they have a conversation. <laughs> He's talking to aberrations. Right, <laughs> apparition. Yeah, that's right. It reminds me of uh, you know, Star think, Wars, well, what, right? It, yeah, that's right. Well, it, that would be, you know, <laughs> yeah, that would be the projection. Yeah, but but it, it's, in fact, they, they talk to them, and you think, oh, right, as you can say, how are you going, guys, or something. You know, it's it's just sort of a, a ludicrous thing. So <laughs> so Jesus goes up and he has a conversation with Moses and Elijah, and is there what do we what do we know about that conversation? What what is the conversation? Yeah, what's I mean, it, is is there anything? Well, written? it doesn't say it. 
Oh, it see, that's bizarre. Yeah. Oh, you would think that the, yeah. there would you would think there'd be something to say about what they what they were speaking about. That's right. You know, and the... then they come down for it's followed up by immediately they come down from the mountain, right? And it's all about well, is John the is 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 John the Baptist a a Elijah reborn? You know, and that's the debate he has with his disciples. But you see, this is the sort of thing that happens in the Jesus story. You know, it's like it, it, it only takes about two or three sentences. He goes up a mountain. His characters appear. He talks with them. They come down the mountain. You know, blah 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 blah. It, it, it's like... <laughs> if you were a school teacher and you ask, say, seven or eight or nine year old children write a story, and they write wrote something so simplistic, you had another go. Explain what they're doing and what they actually say to each other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But no, the Bible is all this cryptic nonsense. And it's not surprising that very soon, you know, after the Christians assumed control of Europe, that all this stuff was written or painted into into cute little cartoon like images so that everyone could get into their mind. These stories of, you know, going up a mountain, crossing a lake, walking on water. You know, you get all these stories and. Well, they're they're all silly. They're all silly. I'm sorry, but they are. You know, by the same token, there we have these stories, uh, particularly like in Mark, for instance, where the author of these chapters and author of the Gospels and author, uh, they they seem to know things that they couldn't possibly know, like conversations that they weren't <laughs> party to. So. Yeah. On yeah. one on one hand, they're writing about things that they couldn't possibly know in great detail. On another hand, they're writing about things like the Sermon on the Mount and things like that. Thirty or more years later, getting it supposedly word for word, with no mistakes, and yet you have the story of Jesus and and uh, 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 who, who did you say went with him? Peter and uh, went up this mountain. James and John. James and, James John. and John. Peter, James, and John. And they, he, he, okay, so he has this conversation with with Moses and Elijah, and no mention of the conversation. That to me is just you would think that that would be an important part of the story. What did they talk about? <laughs> Nobody, me no mention. Well, no, I mean it's it's, but it's symbolically it <laughs> says a point, doesn't it? But they those two characters are introduced. Rather like I was saying about subordinate gods, yeah. This is elevating Jesus as the most important, yeah, because he's supplanting traditional Judaism. Moses, on the one hand, Elijah, on the other, are subordinate. They're like little helpers for him, aren't they? You know, there's Jesus, and these two subordinate characters now are just there. You know, and that's the that's that's the point, isn't it? The pecking order, the pecking order. It's all about worshipping the right God, isn't it? You know, the worst worst of all sins is worshipping the wrong God. That's, that's terrible. <laughs> no doubt. Really, really. So, so <laughs> let, um, let's see. Uh, the The Sermon on the Mount, how, how, if I'm not mistaken, this sermon didn't take place on one sunny Sunday afternoon. It was, if, if I remember correctly, the sermon is... Days and days and days long. He he would go out there day after day. Is that correct? So, um, well, <laughs> the Sermon on the Mount is a tricky one, really, because as it as it's as it's presented, it's a nonsense. Uh, whether it's a Sermon on the Plain, which which Luke has, or a Sermon on the Mount that Matthew has, um, it it's. It would not have happened that way. And the sermon it's, which is presented to you in the Gospels actually is only 15, 20 minutes at most. You know, and as I've said before, you know, would you traipse up a mountain for that sort of sermon? And why does it go up a mountain? And, and who goes up a mountain? At first, at first, he's talking to his disciples, but then at the end, there's a whole multitude listening to this stuff, so it's it's a it's a tricky one. But it, it but again, it doesn't really make sense. It doesn't really make sense, and it is symbolically 
reflecting, you know, Moses going up and getting the ten tablets or the two tablets off of God and, and, and you know, the ten commandments. Here is, is a sort of counterpart to it. Is You know, so the story is almost like a revamped Judaism. You know, it's all precedents are in Judaism and it's it's refitted for this. The idea is being Christianity is the new Israel, you know, the new the new covenant, the new dispensation. So you can you can see where it all comes from in the end. It's 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 just you, you realize in the end you can't think of any of this as really happening. None of this really happened. Oh, never the, because ne- it has another origin. Sure, sure, I'm with you. Uh, but nevertheless, according to the biblical story, I'm curious how long, how many words, how many paragraphs, just roughly. I don't. You probably don't know exactly, but if I was to read the entire Sermon on the Mount, how how large of a text would I be reading? What five hundred words, a thousand yeah. words, less? Uh, yeah, yeah, something of that order. 500 to a thousand words yeah it's it's not a great deal it, 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 I've, I've read it aloud you know it's 15 minutes it's a 15 minute it's not even a, a it's not it's, it's nothing like we've been on the air today you know it's just nothing really okay it's just nothing i mean okay so you have to conclude well it's been summarized all right it's been summarized it doesn't it doesn't give you that clue in the, in the text but you could say oh yeah well it's been summarized but then w- well, what bits have been left out you know what bits of you know so it's 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 not yeah. even particularly profound to be honest well besides the fact that the earliest possible writing would have been something like 30 years after the fact by comparison the trial of jesus as you mentioned in one of your presentations the trial of jesus in the gospel of mark is 20 sentences long, 360 words, the entire trial of Jesus, mm. that's all he has to say? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is surprising. It's, it's sometimes biblical scholars are forced to use the term uh, uh, gospel, you know, uh, bre- not brevity. What do they use? The term? Uh, uh, you know, they are, they write very brief you know oh, what's happening here oh i'm about to i'm about to share my screen so don't worry about this just go just keep talking i wanted to share something as you spoke go oh, ahead oh, oh, okay. yeah i can hear okay. you yeah we got you i'm, I'm just switching things around because <laughs> i'm about to share this because it's I'm, relevant I'm i've got a various i've got a screen, wow. go ahead i've got a screen capture here i just wanted to share as you as you were speaking Mm. This is actually, I, I took the screen grab from uh, one of your video presentations, The Trials and Errors, uh, yep. Jesus Has His Day in Court. So this is from your video, Trial by the Jews, mm-hmm. and uh, obviously uh, this is from Mark, as you mentioned, 20 sentences, 360 words. Um, I think it's pretty remarkable, uh, starting at the, I won't read the whole thing, but you know, uh, and they led Jesus to the high priest, no mention of the who the priest was. I would think that that would be an important part. The high priest, no name, nobody's ever mentioned. They just say, taken to the high priest, right? I don't, I don't really understand how these gospel writers, particularly in this case, referring to Mark, could write such a story without, and, and omit what would obviously be important parts of the story. Like, who is this high priest? Who, who, you don't mention any names, you, mm. you you'd think mm. there'd be some more detail. <laughs> it, it seems pretty yeah. ad hoc. <laughs> we, we have to judge it in its time and place, of course. Um, you know, you wouldn't have had a literate population. You know, a very tiny number of people could have read this stuff. It was essentially read by the priests in in a, a you know a sermon or or a, a, some sort of preaching operation and in those contexts you probably there was a a reason to be succinct and stress conclusions because you're talking to an un, un, uneducated uh, audience given over to susp- su- uh, superstitions and it probably suits the purposes. 
Today, of course, we can examine it in, in, in infinite detail with the use of computers and so on. And, and um, unfortunately, of course, it, it, it can't pass the test. It, it, because we can use such sophistication, we see all its, uh, it, all its flaws, all its, all its, uh, all its errors of, of logic and, and place and contradiction. Um, but in its time and place, it was probably appropriate. So here, as I read this from, from Mark, trial by the Romans. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests with the elders and scribes, again, no mention of anybody's name, just, you know, hey, all these important people, you know. Um, and the whole council held a consultation, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. So, uh, and Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? So I'm wondering... This is another example of how, like the writer of Mark, how would Mark know these things? I mean, Jesus was arrested. He was incarcerated. He was taken to Pilate. I mean, even if Mark was Jesus's best friend and a disciple who followed him everywhere, did Mark follow him to jail when he was arrested? Was Mark in the jail cell? Did Mark go and stand next to him with a pen and paper as he spoke to Pilate? How does Mark know these things? Yeah. You, you you are thinking though uh, as a skeptical uh, atheist <laughs> you you've got to allow for the holy spirit to be uh, inspiring mark i mean that's that's where Christians <laughs> from, isn't it? Yeah. Um, which 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 opens up all kinds of possibilities i mean why didn't he inspire him all the time then if he he does at these crucial junctures um uh, yeah, that, that's <laughs> I can't a, defend it, but I know I know people who do. <laughs> it's a good question why it's so selective. <laughs> well, like I was saying, it's it's bizarre because these gospel writers they seem to know things that logistically they couldn't possibly know, and yet at the same time they omit things that they should have known and would be important parts of the story that they just omit. It's bizarre the way it's written. Yeah. It's it's clearly yeah. it's a tale. It's a fairy tale, and it's not. De well, yeah, it's not designed I mean, to be written the way people would normally behave. Yeah, yeah. I I always find on on that point there there is a a, a notable example of that when in the Old Testament and 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 uh, there is the reference to what happened, and it makes reference to Pharaoh. Now. It's quite interesting that almost never, almost never does the Old Testament refer to a pharaoh by name. It's always pharaoh. Right. You know, and and you think, well, well I lose track how many is it more than 200 pharaohs to choose from. Sure. Gives an awful, awful lot of scope for ambiguity <laughs> and error. You know? True. Absolutely. I've, that's that's another thing that I've noticed, and you're absolutely right. They never mention any pharaoh by name. They always just say, pharaoh did this, pharaoh did that. So let's talk yeah. about um, uh, the trial of Jesus, as with, with particularly as Barabbas enters the scene. I want you to talk to my audience about the, the concept of the scapegoat and, the, and this idea. It's not even an idea. It's a real thing that Barabbas actually had a first name. So I already know it, so go ahead and tell my audience. I'll let you <laughs> spill the beans. What's, what's Barabbas's first name? And why is well, that significant? Well, isn't that interesting? Is it, is, it, is it perhaps Jesus Barabbas? Well, yes, it is Jesus Barabbas. And Barabbas, Barabbas, son of the father. Jesus, son of the father, is in hell with Jesus. My God, is that a cool? Coincidence or what? You know, um, it, it's it. Well, of course, there's, there's something important going on here. It's uh, I don't know if I, this time and I, I can remember it too clearly, but it's all to do with Jesus' uh, Jewish festivities and and what happens at different times of the year. But there is this idea that the uh, 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 is it a Passover or is it at the other festival? The Jews send out a goat carrying the the sins of, of the nation you know they send send out a goat so one goat is released and the other goat is sacrificed so that's how you and and 
if you know, if you bear in mind this common thread all the time that we are trying to reproduce everything about the Jewish religion in Christianity, in, in with the focus always on Jesus. So he becomes the two characters. He is basically both, you know, the sacrificial goat and the goat that is sent out into the desert to die. Now, if you try and read the story as history, of course, you run into into real problems. Not only do you have to excuse the fact that it's the same guy and is in prison at the same time with the same name, um, but uh, where, there is no precedent in, in Jewish scripture for the release of a prisoner. Yet this is what Pilate, in one of the Gospels at least, is obliged to do. He, you know, he releases Barabbas, the known murderer, or that's what the, the, you know, the Gospels tell us, so no murderer, they release him and it's Jesus who is sacrificed. So it's the, that's the trick. That's the way in which they present this story. So, you know, it's, 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 it's as drama, I suppose, as some, some useful effect. You know, it's been used a lot of the time in art and, 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 and literature. But it is sim it is always symbolism. It's symbolism and, and it's reflecting, uh, to re reflecting an earlier uh aspect of, of the jewish religion and, and and the double sacrifice as i've said somewhere in my, in, in one of my videos it's it's twice twice the nonsense twice the nonsense <laughs> so the typical scapegoat tradition was to take two goats of equal uh value uh, oh, without blemish two with, goats without blemish that's all right uh-huh and as as similar as they could acquire Two, two goats of, of similar quality and value. Uh, the tradition was that they would place the sins of Israel on one goat, release it into the wild to die in the desert, sometimes driving it over a cliff to die and yeah. vanquishing the, you know, expelling the sins of the Israel for one more year. They, this was the Yom Kippur ritual. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Yom Kippur. Yeah, yeah. So Jesus's trial takes place on Passover, right? Late in the evening? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't it against Jewish law, number one, to have a late night trial, and number two, to have a trial on a holy day? Wasn't that there against... There are so many, so many transgressions of what would be, as our understanding is, of, of correct procedure among the Jews that the Christians have basically invented for their Jesus story. And the story, as, as I've said, the six, the six trials of Jesus, because between the Gospels, it moves all over the show, between one and two chief priests in the morning, in the evening, in, in, in both occasions and so on. And uh, uh, it's a complete mix-up. The whole business is a complete mix-up and... and uh, even clergymen uh, uh, will res respect the fact that it, it can't be given a coherent understanding. The thing about multiple Gospels, and I tumbled that after a number of years, uh, you think, well, why didn't they just harmonise it all into one and, and then solve, them, solve the problem of, uh, you know, because all these cynical clinics, cause cynics who come along and criticise them and point this, why didn't they just harmonise it? And the answer is, I think, well, if you've got four versions of the truth, if one doesn't work, well, maybe another one will. That's why the Christians are quite happy with this. If you can't find an answer in the gospel, you go to another gospel. Oh, there's the answer. And, and that's what we and see that, today with apologetics. Yes. That's exactly what they do. That's what they, exactly what they do. Uh, that's yeah. ex that's, it's been, the, the term has been coined. I don't know who first coined the term. Um, it might have been Christopher Hitchens. It's called cafeteria Christianity. You just go to the cafeteria and pick and choose the parts that you like. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's so true. It's so true. Okay. I don't know where you're standing at the moment, but here it's one o'clock, and I think I really ought to um, get some shut eye at this stage. <laughs> well, I, Ken, we're we're almost to the end of my notes, and I've only got a half a page. And, and I'm perfectly fine to let the rest of these questions go. I do have two questions that I would like to throw at you, if you don't mind. Um, the, okay. um, 
The $64 million question, here it comes. What does it mean to fulfill the law? Because I hear from common apologetics so often when they refer to the Old Testament, the New Testament, when you're arguing with Christians and, and, and they'll say things like, well, that was the Old Testament. We have a new covenant. And, and Jesus says, I have, and then I remind them, Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill the law. So what does it mean to fulfill the law? Well, it's one of those words where you Christians, you know, it is used for their flim flam, isn't it? You know, f you're absolutely right. There is a contradiction there. In Matthew, for certainly, yeah, Jesus is meant to say, is, is, is alleged to have said, I come to fulfill the law. Not, you know, I'm not going to change anything. You know, it's not all going to be. Not one jot but, or tittle. But then, or <laughs> dot or tittle. <laughs> yeah, that's dot or tittle. That's absolutely right. Um, then the, the Christians are fond of this idea. Well, yes, the Old Testament God was was God with his bad hat on, you know, the black hat on. He's, <laughs> he, he's punishing people. He's a just God. It's just that some people would be killed, if not actually lots of people would be killed. That's just. But the new God. Oh, he's a loving God, God is, but is, sometimes is, he's a white prick. hat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's, but he's a loving God. Now that's the that's the that's the that's the that's the notion that's presented there. They can play uh, any which way they will. I mean, you know, they, they, you can never accuse them of consistency. Um, it sounds like you know, it, that, it, it sounds like Stockholm syndrome. He's a loving God, <laughs> but sometimes he's a bit of an asshole. <laughs> yeah, really. So okay, um, so. Again, uh, one more time, what does it mean to be fulfilled? Because he says that line immediately after saying, I have not come to abolish the law. So if I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill, what does it mean to fulfill? Well, it, it, it might mean many things. I, I, I suppose it could mean that uh, God's law was transgressed and he needs to reinforce them by making everybody obey, everybody conform. So maybe this is, you know, the, 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 the great totalitarian system. We all march in step and, and you know, sing hallelujahs for eternity. And, you know, this, this, this is fulfillment. This is fulfillment. You know, it, but it's one of many words they use like that. Like, you know, uh, um, what, are, what are some of the other words? Uh, they often use it of prophecy. Jesus fulfilled prophecy, or, 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 or you know, it, I think my brain is beginning to seize up now. Um, yeah, I, I, it, it could mean anything because, you know, it's, we are not trying to, if you're giving a Christian stone, we're not trying to prove something by logic, you know. You, it's, right. it's, large, it's a large, emo, an emotional appeal, isn't it? Right. It's, emo, it's an appeal to, you know, times I've been requested by Christians to, you know, put, put my books away, stop thinking and pray to Jesus, pray to God, let him into my heart. All this yes. sort of thing. It's, it's the idea of giving up on reason. Reason is what the, 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 the wisdom of man, but it's not the wisdom of God. So, uh, Ken, I know it's late. I know it's late for you. You've been so gracious with your time. I can't thank you enough. I have one more thing I want to throw at you, and then I'll be I'll be glad to let you go. Um, one I'll, more, just one more. I, I, I swear to the God that I don't believe in one more. <laughs> I was listening to an interview. It was a Vinny Eastwood interviewed uh, Ralph Ellis and Joe Atwill today, or actually, well, I, yesterday. I listened to this. Um, Somewhere in Josephus, Jesus is referred to as the tecton. Are you familiar with that word? What's that word again? Tectron. Tecton. T e k t o n. Tecton. Oh, tecton. Yeah, builder. Builder. Yeah. Right. So I looked it up, and it means craftsman, tradesman, woodworker, and it also means yeah. mason, stonemason. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, since we know that Jesus was 33 years old at, upon his death, and he's known as, referred to as Tecton from Josephus, also his father, by the way, Jesus and his father are referred to in Josephus as Tecton. Um, uh, Joe mentions the reference to Jesus and his father as Tecton and how it fits into the symbolic aspect of the cornerstone of the new religion, and make straight the path for the Lord. These are all Masonic phrases, Masonic sim symbologies, and, and let's not forget again that Jesus was 33. What say you? <laughs> well, I mean, you're right about the meaning of tecton, yeah. Uh, but I'm not so certain that Jesus was 33. I mean, uh, on what are you basing that... that, 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 that uh, I mean, yes, it's often said that's most likely date of the crucifixion, yeah, and if he was born in zero, yeah, he was 33, but it doesn't really work out that way, does it? I mean... Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I've, <laughs> I've always heard that Jesus was 33. Yeah, that is the number that I've also heard. I've never he heard was, anything else. He was crucified at 33. Just like Superman, yeah, he, just like Superman, who gets his energy from the sun. He's another allegory for uh, Jesus. <laughs> Superman is also thirty-three. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it doesn't actually say his age anywhere in in, in the Bible. So uh, you know, but it, but it has it's as a long tradition, a long tradition of arguing that Jesus uh, was crucified in thirty-three, and uh, presumably, you know, basing on that, and he was born on zero, but. But he wasn't, was he? If he was born in in in, in the time of uh, Herod the Great, uh, it, it would have put him back what six, four four BC. If he was born at the time of the of the census in the time of, of six AD, there's like a ten year window. So we're we're very vague on which year he might have been born. So we would have to be vague about his age. You know the. He was 33 plus or minus 10 years, put it that way. There we go. Is it? Well, Ken, I, I can't thank you enough. I'm, you're, you've been so gracious with your time. I know it's late for you, and I can't thank you enough. And before I let you go, would you just give me a nice, clean sound bite? Give me one more. It isn't true. It isn't history. <laughs> But you've said it yourself. It isn't true. It isn't history. It's just more astounding rubbish from the New Testament. Yeah. Bravo. Absolutely. Bravo. Tell, will this be available as a recording for? Oh yes, sir. It, oh yes, sir. Loading? It is. It is live right now. It will be on my channel. It's already on my channel. And yep. um, if you you, oh, you feel absolutely free at your leisure, um, if you would like to grab a copy and download it, mirror it, post it on your channel, whatever you like to do, um, I just can't thank you enough for your time. You've been extremely gracious. It's very late for you, and, and that I just can't thank you enough. It's 1 a.m. for you. Go get yourself a cup of tea and grab yourself <laughs> some rest, and, and thank you, Ken. You, you're wonderful, <laughs> and we love you. Thank you. I've so enjoyed it immensely. Thank you, thank you so much, Thank, thank you, Amy. I, I'm sorry I didn't you have a whole lot now. to input, but I was fascinated. <laughs> I know you were listening intensely. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I certainly was. All right. Anyway, Ken. all right. Thanks Take again. Thank you, Ken. Have you have your good night, and I'll be in touch. Thank you. Love always. Oh. Well, that was bloody brilliant. That was awesome. I do love Ken Humphreys. Um, I love listening to his presentations. He, his YouTube channel has maybe a hundred presentations where he he doesn't just talk off the cuff. He you know he does a good bit of preparation and he packs a wallop of information in a ten or twelve minute or you know seven eight ten twelve fifteen yeah. minute presentations. If you've ever checked out his channel, yeah, the guy is a wealth a wealth of information. So, um, well, and he certainly didn't do badly about delivering great deals of information in short order tonight. I was very impressed and, and like I said, pretty much riveted. <laughs> and you asked some awesome questions. 
Well, um, at this point, I will respond to the chat briefly before we close this out. Um, Patch. Patch is with us. And um, he said, see, that's the thing that, uh, uh, that, that's the thing no one on the other side uh, Pat Patch is, he's, he's a religious, he's a Christian. He says, no one on the other side provides proof of anything. Well, that, that's not exactly true, Patch. Uh, there is some proof. Some of it we provided here, uh, proofs from the Bible itself uh, of the various aspects of some of the stories that just don't add up logistically. They don't make any real uh, logistical sense. And, and there are some proofs historically that show that some of these stories are absolutely false. But, but Patch goes on to say, they, uh, uh, proof of anything they espouse, but they demand proof from those of us who believe in the Christ and God as a whole. And well, unfortunately, Patch, if you're the person on, on the side who makes a claim, then you're the one with the burden of proof. That's true. Allison says BS. Well, I uh, be bullshit, huh? What? What's? What's? Where's the bullshit? What did I say that's wrong? What? What did I say that was wrong there? That there are, there are absolute proofs that show many aspects of the Bible. No, we didn't cover them all. I mean, I've only had two hours with Ken, and we only covered a couple of topics. <laughs> no, you are what? None of you can actually translate yourself original documents. Well, this is true. However, there have been many uh, very learned individuals who have made some intense translations. And from those people, I, I learned that the line in the King James Version that says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live is far better translated as thou shalt not tolerate a poisoner, which is a very different picture. So then we have to ask, whose translations do we accept? Well, you're right. And Allison, you're right as well. We don't have all of the original documents, which brings it all into question, doesn't it? I mean, without literally knowing for sure that we have actual literal original documents we're all left to do all kinds of speculating but if, but, but if you're a believer if you're the guy who says jesus existed god is real if you're making a positive claim then the burden of proof falls on your shoulders that's just how these things go yep it kind of reminds me of uh joseph smith and his golden tablets <laughs> you know yeah, and how, um, how he says that that's what they said, and in fact, there was a situation where his part wife, of it, his, part of it, was written down and and lost. Well, his it was either his wife or fiance who took the first pages, and she said, "Oh, really? Go do it again." Yes, and he yes. Could, and he couldn't. And, well, and he just said that God told him that he didn't have to. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and and by the way, yeah. And it's like it, you know, how do how do we know if we don't have all of the original documentation? I'm a gatekeeper Jew. Okay, believe what you want. I'm not even going to argue with people who talk like that. Really? <laughs> yep, you're right. Have a nice life. You know. I'm just a fucking dumbass with a YouTube channel, and I'm doing what I can to talk to people and get to the bottom of things. And if you don't like that, then go watch somebody else. I, Absolutely. I, I ain't keeping no fucking gates. And if you can prove to me God is real, then for God's sakes, fucking do it. Because my eternal soul is on the line, too. And if you think I don't care, you're fooling yourself. If you think that I don't study these things because I just want to pass it on. Like a lot, of, a lot of believers, you know, Christians will say to atheists, they'll say things like, and I hear this all the time, you just... You just don't want to follow God's law. You just want to sin. You just you don't want to believe because you just want to sin. Get no. I'm sorry. No. no. <laughs> really? No. What? <laughs> no. If there really is a heaven and a hell, 
If there really is an afterlife, believe me, I want to fucking know about it. Yes. Prove it to yourself. That's not how it works, Allison. I could prove anything to myself. If you believe hard enough, then there's a purple elephant <laughs> in the corner over here. He's just invisible. I can see him. You can't see him? What? He gave me a, re a revelation. You know what I mean? I could go that whole route. That's just that's that's a non-answer. Yeah, you, you know, proof is something external. It has to be. You can't prove something that's only in your mind. Allison, and uh, you know what? Do you want to open this up for a minute? Do you guys want to come in here and uh, talk about this? Because I hate having to read and have it have you guys type. If you guys seem really engaged, if you want to come in and talk to me about it, then we can talk about it. I, I'm going to report on the Reiki and to state that I do feel substantially better since Allison gave me her assistance. So oh. I'm 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 going to say that something on that level definitely works. Really? Yes. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna do that? You're gonna give me an attestation that Allison yeah. did some over the phone Reiki with you and you feel better because of it. I'm going to say I'm going to say I will give very high probability. Yes. Okay. Well, I can't argue with that. You had your experience and I know nothing yeah, about it. Yeah, and I'm not going to try to 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 pound it into you. It's true. It's true because no, I'm, I I can't even argue. I mean, I, if you yeah. say you had an experience, then We're saying then, yeah. And, That's and, my experience for whatever it's worth to anybody else and, in the universe. And by the way, Amy, if you feel better, then good for you. I'm gl yes. I'm glad to hear it. And I don't care I'm, if it was Reiki or your own mind. I don't care how it worked. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I my my breathing is my breathing is substantially better. Oh well, Allison is here now. You could you feel free to say thank you, and I know you already. Oh, did, I but... yeah, I've I've definitely said thank you to her over emails, and you know I really appreciate it. You know my my look on things is that as long as people are choosing their behavior ethically. I really don't care what they believe. It's only when they decide that, you know, God hates fags, let's go kill all the fags, you know, no, that's unethical. Hey. If you do it, it's unethical. Hey, even, hey you, another point for Allison, Patch in the in the chat said that she helped him after some surgeries and he is also attesting that there's something to it. So yeah. I mean, if you get something out of it, then I applaud you. Uh, I'm I'm glad that you feel better. I'm glad you got something out of it. The problem I have is proving what it was, how it works, and 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 making a um uh what's the oh uh, uh yeah I understand what you're saying. There's there's no uh no external proof beyond testimony. That that's all you've got, and I I can see why that is a difficult thing when that's all you've got. It's not going to be something that proves anything, and you know I'm I'm cool with that. <laughs> well, um, looks like Gandalf didn't make it. He did no. He, he, he did he jump did. in the chat earlier and said that he was on his way home he was yeah, driving he, and stuck he, in traffic he, he contacted me and said that he got uh sent through a detour and had a big argument and uh there there was somebody who was refusing to pay something that that he should have and i'm not really sure the details on that but he came home in a very bad mood and decided not to bring the show down with his bad mood. So he's been listening in. And, uh, you know, I, I guess, it, you know, if he, I kind of appreciate that he didn't want to bring unhappiness into the mix. Oh, yeah. Um, David Lang does make an interesting and, and a point worth noting here. He says, exactly, Christianity 
is always being forced onto me. I don't push being agnostic on anyone. Um, I, yeah. I, I would only follow up by saying, raise your hand if you've ever had a knock on the door and somebody, when you answer the door, they say, hey, I'm from the church of no church and I just wanted to talk to you about God not existing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can't say I can raise my hand. No, I'm pretty sure that never happens. Like, ever, yeah, like ever. that's that's the inter <laughs> an interesting point. You know, atheists and agnostics don't go door to door pushing their beliefs on people. This is my YouTube channel. You're free to go watch somebody else if you don't like what I'm talking about. Yes, exactly. The you know, I, I agree. I I will say, you know. Personally, I'm not religious, but if you are, that's okay. And I'm not going to try to convince you to be not religious. <laughs> and I'm not trying to act like I know everything. I'm not trying to pretend like I'm certain that Reiki doesn't exist, that we don't have a connection to each other somehow, some way, through some electrical, electromagnetic gamma. I don't care what kind of energy radiation you want to label it or whatever it turns out to be. I'm not here saying that none of that, that, that that's all 100% bullshit. There might be something to it, and I'm open to the idea that there is. And I'm happy, if, if you get something out of it, I'm happy for you. I'm genuinely happy. I'm not trying to shit on Reiki. And I, Allison, and you know this, we talked, okay? I, I think you know that I'm not trying to shit on that idea. Yeah, well... Empirical. I'm... Empirical is the word I was looking for earlier. Yeah, it there is no empirical evidence. I agree. I I I don't know that there couldn't be. You know, it is conceivable that there may be devices That's that right. can measure things that That's will right. That's right. establish it, but I don't know of any and I don't know anybody who does. You know, it it may or may not be measurable. But until we have something to measure it, it's just testimony, and that's all it is. Patch has another surgery on Thursday. Patch, my thoughts are with you. As are mine. <laughs> I, ha I have no ill will. I only hope that you do well and that you get better. And if that means that somehow my intention somehow send some kind of energy that somehow is some way beneficial to you, then bravo. If you get something out of it, then good for you. I don't care if it's measurable. If, if it works, I don't fucking care. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I really don't there care. There you go. Yeah, and yep. It's like placebo, right? I mean, I don't care. Placebo works like 30% of the time. Placebo actually works. People feel better for all kinds of things. You're not going to grow a limb. Right? You're not going to regrow a limb from prayer. You're not going to regrow a limb from placebo. But if your back aches, if your head aches, if you're having muscle cramps and you're having migraines or you're having some sort of internal pain or whatever, Reiki, yeah. Reiki appears to work. It's a relaxation technique. And there's no doubt that relaxing and meditating is beneficial. There's no doubt. Well, I, don't, here, I don't doubt here, that at all. Yeah, but here's the thing. The, the sender of the Reiki is the one that's doing the energy that's con conduiting. I didn't sit back and go, okay, I'm going to receive Reiki now. Let me relax. I didn't do that. How, well, I just went about my day. Oh, okay. Really? So there wasn't yes. like a phone consultation. You just no, ag agreed no. and she did her thing and you weren't yep. even in contact. Pretty much. Oh. I mean, he, she said she was going to do it and then, you know, I went awesome, and now I'm breathing better and feeling better, and, you know, I'm like, okay, I think that something worked there. Oh, okay, I, let's just, let's, let's, let's not fall into the trap. Let's remember, correlation does not equal causation. Oh, and I agree. So I agree. Maybe Allison did something and maybe it helped or maybe you got better on your own. Let's be real here, right? Yeah, I I'm not going to say that I know absolutely, you know, put my slam my fist on the table kind of thing. But I am going to say that it feels it, it feels like an energetic healing. I don't know what else to say about that. And again, testimony 
hearsay, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Again, I don't okay. care. If you feel better, I'm happy for yep. you. It, you know, I think it worked. That's that's what I I'm, have I'm to genu say. I'm genuinely happy for If it works, if, if you feel better, you call it whatever the hell you want. Okay. I, I, really, <laughs> I really don't care. There you go. There you okay. go. If, if you want to call it purple unicorns did the job, fine. <laughs> as long as you don't need my tax dollars for any reason, you believe what yeah, you want to believe. Yeah, I want I want your tax dollars. <laughs> Give me your tax dollars right now. <laughs> Correlation e equals masturbation, says Larry. No, ma master debation. Master debation. Oh, oh, yeah, I read too fast. <laughs> <laughs> Lanny, uh, Lanny, you're late to the party. Ha weren't you here earlier? No, I haven't seen Lanny through uh, the, the evening. I think he must have either just arrived or he just decided to comment. No, know? Lanny, we're not bashing Yashua. We did, have no. a, we did have a little bit of fun earlier, but we're not here just to bash Yashua, Yeshua, Joshua, Je Jeshush, Yes, Zeus, Hey, Zeus. No, we're not doing that. With Esau, uh, Esau, whatever, <laughs> or or Emmanuel, as he was supposed to have been called, according to one prophecy that failed. Yes. No, we're yeah. not. We're not just Bible bashing, but we have had our fun. Yes. Okay, you know I did find it interesting when Ken mentioned thirteen epistles. Yes. I, I didn't want to interrupt his flow. And right. I, I had right. a whole page of notes that I could have gone into astrotheological aspects. And him and I spoke privately about the work of Akaria S., otherwise known as D.M. Murdoch, Dorothy Murdoch. Um, God rest her soul. Unfortunately, she passed away. She developed breast cancer, and we, we lost Akaria, one of the, uh, in my opinion, one of the best biblical textual historical scholars that we had available unfortunately we lost her at way too young of an age i think akaria s was amazing what little bit of work that we have a couple of books several interviews you can find akaria on youtube she's amazing um unfortunately i'll have to i'll have to look her up so it's a c h a r y how do you say akaria s I or or d m murdoch Okay. That's her real name is Dorothy Murdoch, DM Murdoch. And um her, she, I don't know, she goes by a pseudonym or like a pen name like Akaria S and I I really don't know why, but um you can find her either way, but she's she's freaking brilliant. I mean, okay. this woman like used to work in Greece on archaeological digs. She speaks or she used to speak I don't know, at least seven languages, read, write, and speak like seven or more languages, and this chick was just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Have, by the way, just to get a little bit off the topic, did you notice that we managed to get, it looks like 51 thumbs down? Oh, well, we're talking about Jesus not existing, what did you expect? Well, Wait a minute. Well, we, we also had Tidor. 51 thumbs down, I'm only... I guess I should refresh. I'm only showing two. Yeah, I don't refresh. I'm not showing. I'm showing zero thumbs up. Well, oh, look well, at that! We, oh we my God, look at that! Twenty-eight down, nine up. Oh, come on, guys, we can do better than that. Well, how come I've got eight up and fifty-one down? Let I me just, refresh. I Maybe just, some thumbs I, downs I, were removed. I just refreshed. I got nine up, twenty-eight. Yeah. Down. Okay. There did it, it got up to fifty-one, but. Somebody must have removed some thumbs down. Well, maybe and... maybe T Dor had a change of heart. <laughs> <laughs> sure, he did. Oh, that T Dor! I swear. I, as soon as he showed up, making his nasty little comments, it was like I, you beat me to it on the first one. But uh, Lanny says mine says six up and sixty six down. I got it. I get the joke. <laughs> Yeah, Lanny, yeah. but here's the real question. Which one are you? Are you an up or a down? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Allison, I actually have a copy of Urantia. I haven't even begun to read it yet. I'm Actually, I've opened it a couple of times and looked at it. 
And you know, there's a really strange, I have to admit, I have to admit this. A very strange, bizarre coincidence or synchronicity or syncretism happened when I opened that book. And I've done it more than once. Something I was thinking about or an issue that was happening with me in my life, I opened that book at a random point. And it's a huge book. It's bigger than any Bible you've ever held. It's freaking huge. I opened that book at a random page and just read a random passage. And it was like, wow, how relevant is that? You know what I mean? It was almost like a double head twist, double take. So, uh I don't know what I don't know about that book. I mean, from what I know about your Antia book, it was it was what's the word I'm looking for? It was written by a you know, the Kellogg family has a role in this. You know, the 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 business magnets, you know, the people who make breakfast cereal, Kellogg. These people have their hand in the creation of Urantia. Um, which is a really interesting and crazy twist to the backstory um, that they had a, um, a friend of theirs that that was having these crazy dreams or whatnot and they would leave him pen and paper they would leave him for the night he uh, I guess the story is he would go to sleep and he would wake up and then the pages would be written and they would come the next day and collect those those pages and then they over time created this book known as the U book, the Urantia book. Uh, I guess we lost Amy. I'm, I'm all alone now. But um, yeah, man, the, the Urantia book is a really wild thing, man. It's it's like a follow-up to the whole Bible, and it was, it was channeled information. Some guy in his sleep was somehow either writing or or he would sleep and maybe the pen would write on its write its I don't write its I don't know but the story of how this book came to be uh, cuz I did look into the Urantia book it's bizarre man it's it's so it's almost as bad as the Joseph Smith story it's like okay the Kellogg family wealthy wealthy family are involved that's suspicious on its face the idea of how it was written and who was writing it is is, is very very curious and suspicious and i just don't i'm not buying it man i'm just not buying any of it i'm gonna need a little bit more than a story sounds like channeling yeah that's allison that's that's the story i mean look into the origin of the urantia book and, and how those pages came to be that's a kind of exactly the I interviewed a friend of mine uh, who gave me the book, and it's this old, old fella who was um, a very religious, by the way, and he even has a blog, um, a kind of a popular blog in religious circles. Um, it's called, uh, what's it called? Uh, Jesus, no, it's uh, Gospel Parallels dot blogspot.com or something like that gospel or gospels plural gospel or gospels parallel or parallels um, I forget how it all works out but gospel parallels dot blog dot org whatever um, and I did an interview with this guy who gave me the book who has the blog I asked him about the origin of the Urantia book in the interview he, he was telling me that he looked at the metadata on his blog and he could see that people literally from Vatican were visiting his blog, his website to check out what he had to say about gospel parallels. And so in, in, in the metadata, he was able to decipher that there are people from the Vatican checking out his blog. Hey, what's up, Josh? Are you going live, Josh? You going live tonight? Because we just got done with uh, Ken Humphreys. I'm just sort of wrapping up this. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, no worries, no worries. I'm having technical <coughs> difficulties. Uh, no Serious worries. technical difficulties. Yeah. yeah, we should probably go ahead and, and wrap this up. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, Josh, are you going live, bro? Are, are you doing a you doing a show tonight? Let me see. It's only eight thirty-five my time. 
uh, you got time. Uh, we only had Ken for two hours, and we started an hour early. So, um, anyway, I don't want to uh, drag this video out for those who just want to see Ken. You know, they will just want to check out the, the Ken Humphreys interview. But um, I did want to address the, the chat briefly. That's kind of odd, but so is the Vatican. No doubt, David. All right. Um, thinking about going live at 9. So that would be that usual time, right? That would be 10 o'clock my time. Hour and a half. Well, if you do, bro, I'll see you over on your channel. But until then, I'm going to say thanks, everybody, for being here. And I really enjoyed chatting with Ken Humphreys. And I'm surprised I didn't... Um, uh, please write down your email so we can set up a time to get together and do another show. Um, Patch, did you leave your email? Let me look. Did you leave your email? Did I miss it? I can't read everything while I'm running my jaws. There it is. Gotcha. Tannis at yahoo.com. Tannis. Interesting. <laughs> That's where Indiana Jones went. All right, I just copied your <laughs> just copied your email. Um, Patch, are you? Um, thanks, James. Love you back, buddy. Um, Patch, are you? Um, are you on Hangouts? Patch, I'll add you into Hangouts, and I'll, we'll connect on Hangouts. Oh, that was a, that's a Yahoo email. I I need a Gmail. Never forget, Jesus loves you, Rufus. Um, I, I can't forget that. I'm reminded every day. Every day. I just need you to prove the guy existed. Never forget, Lanny, the, the flying spaghetti monster loves you too. Um, Tannis at Gmail. Uh, Patch, <coughs> yes, you are on Hangouts. Okay, I'm going to add you. To, I got both here, buddy. I'm going to add you to Hangouts, and we'll connect. Absolutely. Fluffy the... Pretty Kitty loves everybody, too. <laughs> there you are. <clears throat> there you go. Just sent you a, a clickety-click. And I've got your other email up here. Don't delete that. Leave it in the chat, Patch. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get your Yahoo. I'm on Yahoo. I'll get that one. But uh, again, thank you, everybody. I do appreciate it. Cool. Anyway, all right. Cool. Cool, Patch. Allison, Patch, David, Lanny, James, anybody else? If I missed you, I'm sorry, but thanks for joining us. Karen. Um, I do appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and close this out, and we will see you next week. We have Charles Koss next week, do we not, Amy? Uh, it looks very positive to have Charles Koss next week, yes. Uh, that would that would be Dr. Charles Koss. Dr. Charles Koss, That's yes. That's right. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> I appreciate you guys, and uh, thanks a lot. We will see you all on the flip side. Be good to each other, and pick up your fucking trash. Love always.